ultimately, in terms of the impact we end up having in the world, you could think of virtue as being a multiplier, not by, you know, some number between one and 10,000 or something with this huge variation, but maybe as a number between minus one and, and plus one or, or something like that, or, or maybe most of the, the values in that range. Um, but, but maybe if you're really, really virtuous, you know, you're a three or something. But the fact that there is this negative bit is really relevant um, and that it's very much possible to actually just produce bad outcomes. Um, clearly, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried seems to be an example of this. And then if you've scaled up your impact, then you could end up with massive negative effects through having a bad character, maybe by taking too many risks, maybe by um, trampling over people on your way to try to achieve those good outcomes and, or, or various other aspects. Hey listeners, Rob here, Head of Research at 80,000 Hours. Interviews with philosopher and mathematician Toby Ord are always super popular with all of you. And to be frank, he makes my job as a host super easy. So I'm always looking out for an excuse to bring him back on. And I got one when on YouTube, I, I saw his keynote presentation at an Effective Altruism Global Conference uh, that happened back in February. Toby in that talk goes over three little discussed reasons from philosophy why it's a bad idea to go all in on pursuing any particular goal at the expense of everything else, which are uh, th three ideas that are kind of obvious to me in retrospect, but which I hadn't really uh, thought all that much about before. As he explains in the conversation, Toby had looked at this topic before, five or ten years ago or something, but he was motivated to dig into it and write about it again because of the possibility that Sam Bankman fried who stands accused of committing serious fraud while CEO of the cryptocurrency exchange FTX, was motivated uh, to do that and, and to break the law by his desire to give away as much money as possible to worthy causes. In the conversation, uh, we go over the rise and fall of FTX and some of the impacts that that's had, what Toby hoped effective altruism would and wouldn't become when he helped to get it off the ground many years ago, what utilitarianism has going for it and what's wrong with it in Toby's view, the over-optimization argument uh, against being fanatical about any particular goal, the moral trade argument against going all in on any particular moral theory, how so-called global consequentialism, which Toby actually happened to write a thesis on, uh, I think, in the, in, the, in the 2000s, can help explain why even utilitarianism uh, doesn't recommend doing such uh, radical and crazy stuff, and a simple mathematical model of how personal integrity can be so insanely important, even though it doesn't vary nearly as widely as, say, uh, the neglectedness of, of different uh, global problems relative to one another. Toby has also happened to be visiting the AI lab DeepMind on the regular for the better part of a decade now. So towards the end of the conversation, I also get his thoughts on which AI labs he thinks are acting responsibly, how he, how he rates the behavior of, of each of the main players, uh, and how having a, a young kid uh, affects his personal feelings about uh, risks from artificial intelligence. I then also couldn't resist getting a quick reaction from Toby to the argument we've heard on the show multiple times earlier in the year, the idea that problems in infinite ethics present just a fundamental and inescapable problem uh, for any theory of ethics that aspires to be fully impartial. And then finally, we hear how it could possibly be the case that Toby ended up being the source of the highest quality images of the Earth from space, a, uh, a bizarre outcome by, by anyone's standards. All right, the email for the show, if you'd like to send us feedback, is always podcast at 80,000hours.org. Uh, and now I bring you Toby Ord. Today, I'm speaking with Toby Ord, a mathematician turned moral philosopher at Oxford University. His work focuses on the big picture questions facing humanity. His early work explored the ethics of global health and global poverty, and this led him to create an international society called Giving What We Can, whose members have pledged now over $3 billion to the most effective charities that they can find. In those early years of Giving What We Can, from 2007 through 2013, he was perhaps the prime mover in the emergence of effective altruism as an intellectual and social movement uh, that, that, that people under, understood by that term and uh, viewed it as kind of a, a coherent thing. In 2021, he published the book The Precipice, Existential Risk and the Future of Humanity, which was very well received and read by policymakers around the world, ultimately being referenced extensively in UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez's plan for his second term, titled Our Common Agenda. 
We talked about that book back when it was being conceived uh, for episode six, Toby Ord, on why the long-term future matters more than anything else. And then again, when it came out for episode 72, Toby Ord on the precipice and humanity's potential futures. Over the years, Toby has advised many groups, including the World Health Organization, the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, the US National Intelligence Council, the UK Prime Minister's Office, Cabinet Office, and Government Office for Science. Thanks for coming back on the show, Toby. It's wonderful to be back. I hope to talk about the importance of personal integrity and what key things we've learned about AI since the precipice came out uh, three years ago. But first, what are you working on at the moment and why do you think it's important? Yeah, well, I don't know if you've noticed, but quite a lot of stuff's been going on with AI recently. Uh, <laughs> I, so, think, uh, I think we've noticed, yeah. Yeah, may, maybe uh, you know, some, some large fraction of my time is even just keeping up with, with what's going on. Yeah. Uh, in the first part of this year, uh, there'd been a lot of action on improvements in AI capabilities, where we saw uh, Bing and uh, then GPT-4 and uh, a bunch of other things, uh, the open source movement in AI uh, really taking off. And then more recently, uh, there's been real developments in the, the policy side. Uh, the, the Overton window on what's acceptable to, to think about AI progress and the risks that it might bring has really shifted uh, in the last month or so. And so I've been doing a lot of thinking about what would be good policy uh, proposals uh, going forward and how, in general, the landscape is, has shifted and how that should change our strategy. Yeah, what sort of things uh, would people have looked to askew at you for saying a year ago that, that now are very much on the, on, on the table? Well, I, I think the, the big one is uh, that uh, AI poses an existential risk uh, to humanity. Uh, that's something where uh, th there's still a, a bunch of debate about it. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a, a statement signed by the heads of all three of the AGI labs uh, and many other people on their teams, as well as a real who's who of uh, scientists working on AI and many other people from, from other walks of life. And the statement was just very short. It was just saying that, uh, that we believe that AI poses a risk of human extinction uh, and should be a global priority. Yeah. And so that was you know, a very clear statement. Uh, and a couple of days later, actually, uh, not many people noticed, uh, but the, the elders, uh, so that this group of uh, former heads of state and leaders of the UN and the World Health Organization and other, other things, uh, they put out their own statement, which said that they thought that AI posed an existential threat to humanity. And that was signed by such uh, non-tech bros as uh, uh, Mary Robinson, uh, former uh, uh, president of Ireland, former head of, or uh, uh, well, president, I think, of Oxfam, and uh, also uh, Ban Ki-moon, former secretary general of the United Nations, uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland of the WHO. And then uh, after that, uh, we had the current secretary general who he didn't exactly say it was an existential risk, but he said, people are suggesting that it is an existential threat to humanity and we need to take that seriously, which is probably about as close as, uh, as we'll, we'll hear from him uh, on this topic. Uh, so things have really shifted. And then we've even had uh, the prime minister here in the UK, Rishi Sunak, uh, meeting with uh, AI leaders and also uh, proposing a summit to talk about uh, national and international governance of AI because of these risks that it could, could produce. Yeah. Has the response across the board um, kind of exceeded your expectations or would you wish it had gone, it had gone even better? Well, I, I mean, it's hard to, to get more groups of uh, senior people, both within AI, uh, the scientists and the executives, uh, and then also in terms of uh, prominent world figures to actually make explicit statements. Uh, so that's, that definitely has exceeded expectations and has moved very quickly. That said, partly because it's moved so quickly, I think it's left a bunch of people behind. Um, you know, there are people who are saying, you know, wait, uh, what? Mm. Uh, the conversation is a bit chaotic. Uh, there, there's especially a, a strand of people saying, you know, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Uh, which particularly puzzles me. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. I would think that that in general, uh, executives, uh, you know, CEOs of, uh, of organizations wouldn't say that their product could kill you and your family and that we need to be careful about that and, and regulate ourselves. Uh, and even if it was some kind of seven dimensional chess, it wouldn't be at the same time as as all of these other uh, world leaders and uh, and scientists make the same statement about their potential dangers. 
I, I think that you know we would have we would have loved it if when the first evidence started coming out uh, that fossil fuels could cause serious environmental problems or that uh, that tobacco could cause serious health problems if the leaders of those companies said okay we, this is an issue and we're going to need to regulate and and deal with it and be regulated you know that that's exactly what we we hope that these people would say so uh, you know I, I think that that's a much more sensible take yes. Overall, I've, I've been impressed with the number of people who have, I think, very quickly cottoned on to what a serious issue that this is and how many different material risks there are uh, that we don't yet have a good grasp of and that we haven't yet taken any any uh, measures to to mitigate. But uh, there definitely has been a lot of very odd reactions. <laughs> I think that's a that's that's one that definitely stands out as completely baffling. Um, people saying, "Well, of course, uh, you know, Sam Altman would say that his uh, his product might." kill everyone on earth because that's a good way to build hype and raise more money uh, <laughs> i it, it's hard for me to understand what is going on inside people's heads that would generate uh they'll just say something so so baddy uh, from from my point of view yeah i think that this will be a brief window where that argument seems sensible to some people yeah yeah okay well we're going to come back to ai later in the conversation but first off i wanted to talk about effective altruism as a social movement and some some insights from moral philosophy that might be particularly useful for people who are trying to do uh, a lot of, uh, of good with their, with their career. So years ago, you were really involved in the emergence of effective altruism um, as, I guess, both a stream of intellectual thought and as a group of people trying to, trying to take action on, on those ideas. Though I guess you, you've taken more of a backseat on it in, in recent years in order to free up time for other priorities, like, like working on uh, artificial intelligence issues. But yeah, you were asked to give the opening address to um, the, the main conference of the effective altruism movement called Effective Altruism Global when it was held in the Bay Area back in February in order to address the extraordinary ups and downs that the that, that group had experienced over the course of 2022. Uh, I really loved that talk. I, I wanted to go through quite a lot of the things that you said in it uh, here, here today and uh, maybe maybe dig, in, dig into a few of them. Basically, you used the events of 2022 to go through a series of important lessons from the philosophy of doing good that actually kind of transcend any specific case and are uh, useful to, to keep in mind at all times, but uh, which were made particularly salient <laughs> by things that had happened. But yeah, we should do a little bit to, to set the scene. Can you give a short summary of the ups and downs that you were reacting to in, in your talk? Yeah, I was uh, especially referring to uh, a series of events uh, connected to uh, FTX, this uh, uh, company set up by Sam Bankman-Fried and his attempt using this vehicle uh, to make a lot of money in order to uh, give it away and thereby do a lot of good, something that he certainly stated that he saw as, as part of effective altruism and, and its mission. And so in the, even in the first half of the year, though, before all of these, uh, these scandals uh, broke out, it was, I mean, you know, it was a wild ride. The amount of funding going into uh, effective altruism and the types of projects that we care about was extreme. Um, it w- there was an attempt to, uh, through the, the associated FTX uh, Future Fund, an attempt to really scale up uh, the, the giving very quickly. And, and I understand the motivation behind that. Ultimately, if you, you, know, if you do these things uh, slowly, uh, then you're doing less good than you could have, uh, perhaps during a, re- a really critical period uh, in humanity's development. And so getting to scale uh, quickly could really matter. But it was also a pretty, a pretty kind of white-knuckle ride uh, where just you know every kind of week or month uh, amounts of money that you hadn't seen or heard of before were being awarded for the the best blog post on on something or uh, and all of these these prizes and uh, rewards they they caused a number of issues I mean they created distortions where you know I, I could have uh, probably uh, made more money uh, by switching to becoming a blogger or you know instead of a philosopher <laughs> in order to uh, try to scoop up some of these these awards uh, I didn't do that but uh, uh, but some people might have actually got uh, moved towards whichever particular area had announced a prize first uh, and then there was also uh, there was also this kind of strange problem where in the early days of effective altruism, uh, there was there was no money in it. Uh, you could, if you could get a job in an uh, EA organization, you would earn substantially less than than market rates, and so you knew that the the people who are who are working on these issues with you weren't in it for the money because there wasn't any. Whereas all of a sudden there was so much money uh, that it was starting to to become hard to know if you met new people in the area what had brought them in and, and did they have the same kind of moral motivations or not. Hmm. Uh, so 
there were a bunch of these problems. I mean, another one was uh, politics. All of a sudden, there was a whole lot of money being invested uh, in politics and associated with effective altruism. I, I thought that was a terrible idea. Uh, we we'd tried so hard with effective altruism to to not associate it with party politics because it should be the kind of idea that everyone can get behind. Um, no side has a, has a monopoly on the idea of uh, using your career or, or your money to help others. And then all of a sudden, it, you know, there was, there was a risk uh, that it would be perceived as uh, politically biased uh, from this. Uh, so so that, that upwards uh, trajectory, you know, was really hard to deal with, I think, uh, for, for a lot of us. Yeah, it was a very strange, strange time. I guess I hadn't really been paying almost any attention to FTX or Sam Beckman fried I think until quite late in 2021, where it suddenly burst onto the scene. I, I guess the, the valuation must have gone up enormously. And then there was also, I guess, a, a decision by some people to try to start deploying a whole bunch of money really very, very rapidly. So there's a big increase in the amount of funding that philanthropists had effectively earmarked to work on particular long-termist uh, projects or particular kind of interventions associated with with effective altruism. That meant that it seemed like the amount of money that people were trying to deploy was had like, or maybe tr- like per month had kind of tripled or something like that. So it was a vertiginous <laughs> rise, as, as, you, as you say in, in your talk. And it had this kind of um, had this very freewheeling <laughs> sense sense to it uh, from January through I guess uh, November of, of 2022. But yeah, do, do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, about the fall as well for yeah. people who people who haven't been been paying attention? Yeah, well, it, it, I mean, I was going to say it really put it into the news. Uh, although e- even before the fall, uh, that's another one of the aspects of the rise was uh, was FTX being everywhere in the news. And then also people hearing about effective altruism through this uh, this FTX idea. Um, so one particular person's attempt at earning to give, and a, a very unscrupulous attempt, being the thing that, and even before the fall, it was you know associated with crypto, which was an area that, uh, while some people I'm sure have entirely uh, noble intentions, uh, there were many scammers, and so it was a, a problematic area to be intimately associated with. Then. We started to hear news uh, that FTX had gone bankrupt. And then as more information came out, it seemed that it, it wasn't just that it had fallen to 10% of its valuation, it had gone to, uh, to negative. And it was a bit mysterious as to how this was supposed to have happened uh, with a, a crypto exchange. Uh, it shouldn't really be able to lose all of its money like this. Uh, and then as more information came out, it, it seemed, and it, it currently does still seem, that there was a problem involving uh, these two branches of the company. I guess they're technically two separate companies, uh, Alameda and FTX, both started by, by Sam Bankman-Fried, where Alameda was, uh, was a trading company, so, so trading on, on crypto, and FTX was an exchange. And they had kind of special secret relationship together uh, where FTX gave Alameda better access to the exchange than, than it gave to the other people on it. But uh, worse than that, in some some complex, messy way, effectively, uh, the trades that uh, that Alameda was making appear to have been backed, you know, kind of as security by the the investments uh, that all of the people who were using FTX had uh, deposited. Uh, so that even though these deposits were were technically meant to be completely safe uh, because they were meant to be kind of securely encrypted, ultimately it looks like customers will lose a very large fraction of their deposits, although that's not fully known yet. In fact, there's a, there's a lot of features of this that, that still aren't fully known, including details of what exactly happened and also details of the actual motivations and and was it just uh, was it just Sam or you know, did other people know about this? And I'm sure uh, much more of this will come out. There's you know there's still you know going to be a major court case on this and a uh, number of books uh, investigating it and so on. But it's. It's you know a massive uh, financial scandal and and catastrophe for the the depositors uh, who had invested in this. Uh, so that is a, a a pretty shocking thing actually to to be reading about in the news, even if it wasn't connected to a social movement uh, that you helped to found. Right. Yeah. Uh, where it's uh, uh, rather more shocking and uh, and devastating, really, that uh, someone would would do these things, which appear to have been both uh, illegal and immoral. And even if somehow it had worked and uh, they're, they're kind of raiding the funds of the depositors helped them kind of pay for one more trade, you know, which managed to kind of like get them out of the red and uh, save the company, it still would have been illegal and, uh, and I think immoral to do this. Uh, but because it also, on top of that, it failed, 
it also caused vast amounts of damage to the depositors. And then ultimately, a whole lot of collateral damage in other areas, um, including, uh, say, the idea of effective altruism. And also EAs, uh, you know, people who try to take these ideas seriously in their life, all of a sudden, people were concerned about them, even though they had nothing to do with this uh, case in, in, in most cases. And then all of the causes uh, that these people were devoting their lives to try to help with, all of a sudden, you know, lost out on money that was earmarked for them and so forth. Um, so massive amounts of destruction, um, both to the general public and also to this, this movement that aimed at trying to actually just do good in the world. Yeah. I interviewed Sam bankman fried the CEO of FTX, back in early 2022. Uh, and I also put out some comments about the collapse of FTX in late uh, November last year. So I expect quite a few subscribers to the show will at least have a passing knowledge of, of what went on. For people who are interested to, uh, I guess, get, get an update on, on what has been learned uh, since then, uh, if anything, we'll stick up a link to the Wikipedia entry on the collapse of FTX so, so people can do a little bit of digging. Uh, I guess, yeah, this, this, this interview isn't about trying to un- unpiece all of the facts of that case because we have no, no particular expertise and I'm sure other people will do um, a much, much better job. But back in your talk in February at uh, Effective Altruism Global, you said that we don't really know what fundamentally motivated Sam and some of his colleagues to do what they did, which... Although we don't know the specifics, we know it was probably illegal and certainly immoral actions were taken. And I guess that's one reason why today we're going to try to learn lessons that aren't specific to any particular claims about precisely what went wrong in the in the FTX case. But yeah, do, do you think it's still the case that today, uh, when we're recording in, in June, we don't really know what the motives or what the, I guess, what the psychologically was going on that, that, that caused people to, to take these actions? Yeah, no, I, I really don't think that we, I certainly don't know. And um, I think very few people actually do. Uh, but but I, I can speculate a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what are some of the options? Yeah. I mean, I, I suppose I should have added the word allegedly to, you know, every sentence I said before. Uh, so so here, here are some things that we do know. So Sam, even before he'd ever heard of effective altruism, uh, he'd been brought up thinking about the moral philosophy of utilitarianism by his parents uh, and was very dedicated to this. Uh, we can get into a bit more about exactly what utilitarianism is later. But it's a it's a moral philosophy uh, that certainly has some uh, some similarities with with EA, uh, and so if he'd never heard of EA, he may well have just still followed this uh, this view. Mm. And so, to the extent to which part of the concern is that he took maybe unnecessarily risky actions, or that he um, treated people you know merely as a means, uh, or that he was prepared to break the law if it meant that he could achieve the greater good. Uh, all of these kinds of things that that people think might be connected to EA, he was already committed to a theory uh, that actually held stronger versions of those things than effective altruism does. And uh, there's also concerns of connections to uh, to long termism. And I think there's actually even even weaker case really that it's that it's very connected to long termism. Ultimately, Sam was already very concerned about factory farming of animals and and the horrible suffering and injustice uh, involved in that. And that's already such a big area that could that could take so much so much funding trying to actually you know remedy those problems uh, that he already had reason to take you know to take big risks and to try to uh, to be almost insatiable for money in order to try to fix those problems. Mm. Uh, so I think that that doesn't mean that EA is off the hook or something that had no connection to this. There were certainly, you know, I, I think the main kind of connections include, let, let's see, one of them is that the EA community was a kind of supportive community uh, for someone who had non-standard views about doing good in the world. Um, so maybe if there'd been, if everyone he'd talked to had just had a kind of blank stare and, and thought he was crazy, uh, then maybe he actually wouldn't have kind of gone through with these things. Whereas if there was a community that uh, that was more receptive and, and thought, hey, if, if you can make 10 times as much money, maybe that's 10 times as helpful and uh, a really big deal, uh, that, that he then kind of saw um, some some support. Uh, and then there's also the the idea that, you know, that he traded on this kind of good reputation being vouched for by people uh, in this community or s- something like that. And I think that there's something to that as well. Uh, so, yeah. uh, you know, and that's an aspect where I think EAs had been kind of sucked in uh, on this, well, at least to the extent to which to the extent to which it was premeditated or, or that he always had this this idea he might do these things. 
if he was just kind of trying to walk the right path right up until the end and then uh, then did bad stuff, then maybe he maybe the the sucked in story doesn't make sense either. Uh, but I do feel that that um, I always felt a little bit uneasy uh, about the things that I would hear with with Sam Bankman Fried. Uh, not uneasy enough to think that he would do something like this, uh, just to be clear. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's more that that I thought he was the kind of person who who would cut corners uh, when he needed to, quite possibly after thinking it through and so on, but, but a move fast and break things kind of person, let's say, uh, as opposed to a, you know, rob um, lots of people of, of their life savings kind of person. Um, but even even a move fast break things kind of person uh, who seems a bit cavalier about all of these things, uh, perhaps that that was enough evidence uh, to uh, to be substantially more cautious, regardless. Yeah. So I guess one thread uh, on this question of what was the motivation thinks about it from a strategic philosophy point of view, perhaps. I guess another angle you could take is more around personality, I suppose, where some people are just more risk-taking than others and might might, might find it unacceptable the possibility of their business going going bankrupt and would, would be willing to take very extreme risks in order to try to pre- prevent that that happening by, by disposition. I guess to me that has always seemed... At least, I guess, going to be a <laughs> going to be a very important part of the story because you can imagine so many people uh, in a similar position who might have similar philosophical commitments about doing good, who just because of their personalities would never contemplate appropriating money illegally, like uh, in, in in the way that it's alleged that that Sam did, or just taking on the kinds of crazy risks that uh, it seemed were occurring at FTX. You know, even even potentially w- within the law, just in terms of, like you say, the kind of move fast and break things approach to business. So there's also just like, you know, we, we've seen similar scandals in other financial organizations before, and there it seems like the key issues were pride, shame, uh, like recklessness, perhaps ill-judged, rapid decisions, rather than anything in particular about the moral philosophy of the, of, of the people involved. Yeah, I, I think that that is that's quite plausible. Uh, so. You know, there, there's evidence that uh, that there was a culture of taking stimulants there, uh, which I think is actually quite common in uh, uh, hedge funds, but perhaps to a, a higher degree at FTX, uh, and that these can interfere with with people's normal risk attitudes, making people more more risk loving, and uh, yeah, I, I think that one could explain a lot of uh, this just with with appeal to these these regular emotions of uh, of pride and shame ultimately when he was uh, when he was riding high and had uh, had built a, a company becoming a billionaire at a, at a very young age and so on uh, and then feeling that he had so much money to be able to give to these good causes and that a, a bunch of people trying to do good were were kind of looking up to him as as someone who uh, uh, who had really succeeded in uh, in earning uh, so that they could then uh, do a lot of good with that money, and that I- even if he went back down to zero, uh, you know, then people wouldn't be looking up to him anymore. Mm. And uh, and so maybe that's the kind of thing that that led him to think that he could try some, you know, one last uh, double or nothing uh, on all of this. And then perhaps uh, you know when it seemed like they'd actually gone into the into the red, that some feeling of shame, uh, you know, of being caught of that or, or ending at that stage and and pride might have meant, you know, why they, they didn't just wrap it up at that point. Um, I think especially if this is for the Alameda uh, side of things, which I think just should, as far as I can understand, could could have and should have been allowed to fail at that point rather than uh, taking additional bets and bringing uh, FTX down with it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I do feel that it's actually quite hard to, to pull this all apart and to see exactly what's going on. And I should add that with the risk-taking behavior, it's it's also not clear that that even utilitarianism uh, would endorse these kinds of risks. That, that he seems to have been making just bad bets, uh, bets that right. it's not just that they're positive expected value, but with huge variance, uh, but actually that they're bets with negative expected value. Uh, ultimately, Effective altruism was in a situation where it had surprisingly high amounts of funding already, such that additional funding, uh, you know, has this diminishing marginal value at at, uh, at helping with the causes that we care about, and so then taking big risks with the entire future of of that that movement, in order to try to increase that amount of money a bit more, you know, actually just seemed crazy to me. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's one reason why. 
instinctively I'm more inclined to reach for explanations that center on personality or perhaps error or like actually just lacking information or making making judgments very quickly, perhaps when someone's sleep deprived, because it's so hard to provide <laughs> to explain how uh, the actions that were taken could be justified <laughs> from from the point of view of, of trying to do uh, as much good as possible. It seems like unless I'm really misunderstanding how the decision looked to them, like no sane person who shared the goal <laughs> uh, of trying to say reduce reduce extinction would have recommended. <laughs> so no external party ever would have said yes. Like this is the step that you would take. I mean, it's almost it's almost funny to, to say it because it's so obvious. But yeah. Uh, anyway. Yeah. No. I mean, uh, look. I, I think you could well be right, and, and to some extent, it might be kind of galaxy braining this whole thing to think, oh, he is very unusual in having these um these moral beliefs, and he's unusual in having committed this large financial fraud, um, and so they must be connected. Uh, it could be indeed that, that the simplest story involves uh, uh, these emotions and also just just error. Just uh, you know, he he really screwed up. Yeah, I guess uh, it'll be interesting to see what what further um, evidence come, comes out about this later in the year. I think, uh, as you say, there's some investigative journalists. Uh, there's is it Michael Lewis who's uh, producing a book about this, and I think was actually following Sam around around the time. So <laughs> you might have as good a shot as any at uh, piecing together what what on earth was was going on inside people's heads. Okay, uh, let's wind back a bit now, <laughs> so setting aside uh, 2022, and turn back to the period around 2008, uh, when you were really instrumental in, in getting getting effective altruism off the ground. Yeah, how did you find yourself uh, <laughs> helping to make uh, EA into uh, into a thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I've always had a lot of empathy for for people who are in in worse situations than myself. I've had a fairly privileged upbringing um, in a middle class family in Australia. But I don't think any of that is unusual. Like, I, I don't think I had unusually high um, uh, empathy for others or, or something. Um, maybe, maybe somewhat unusual desire to, to just be a good person. But, but again, not, not totally out of the ordinary. And ultimately, uh, you know, I think that where, where things started looking a bit different and more distinctively EA uh, was after I'd left Australia and come to, uh, to Oxford to study. And one of the essays that, that we were uh, made to, to write for my master's degree uh, was this question of, uh, ought we to forgo a luxury whenever we can thereby enable someone's life to be saved? Hmm. And uh, this was, uh, you know, at first I thought, oh, yes, uh, you know, obviously. And then, you know, the gears start to turn and then you think, oh, hang on. No, th- well, if that were true, then maybe you could never have a luxury because uh, each luxury if you think about uh, how much it might cost to save someone's life in poor countries, uh, maybe uh, uh, one would keep having to exchange all of these luxuries uh, for saving more lives. And I, I realized it was connected to uh, Peter Singer's uh, famous uh, famine, affluence and morality essay where he has this idea of you know, the, the drowning child in the, in the shallow pond and, and the analogy to international aid. Um, and so so that all connected with me, and and I, you know, got to uh, read or reread uh, these these famous papers, and and spend a couple of weeks, uh, you know, thinking a lot about that. And is, it, at, is this when you were doing a, a PhD in moral philosophy? I was doing this inappropriately named uh, BPhil degree, the Bachelor of Philosophy, uh, which is Oxford's Masters in Philosophy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so it, it made me me think about these things uh, again, and really kind of really come face to face with it, actually, and. I was impressed by Peter Singer's, you know, by the fact that he, that he came face to face with these things too, uh, and that while he didn't quite live up to uh, to exactly the standard that he recommends in the piece, where he says you should give everything above a certain uh, minimum bar uh, of income, mm. he was, uh, you know, giving a substantial fraction of his income, and he was doing this because of the moral philosophy, you know, th- that he was uh, advocating and that he'd discovered by thinking deeply about it. And this made me realize that it, that it really was possible um, to not, you know, or that, that this wasn't just a game that uh, that academics were playing about. Oh, what obligations do we have? Oh, I can prove this this obligation that sounds super strong. You know, that that's really impressive uh, as a as a paper. Uh, but instead, actually, you know, we might actually have these obligations that we're discovering, mm. and that this is is meaningful and should actually motivate us. And so I found that to be actually quite inspiring. Yeah. So so that's the moral philosophy side. But as I understand, I think 
a pivotal issue was also starting to engage with the empirical evidence out there about uh, what sort of impacts can we have on the world? Because all of this, you know, all of this is good in theory, but if you actually can't help people in a, in a really big way, then maybe we don't have these obligations. But uh, but you actually decided to <laughs> this motivated you to look into that, right? Yeah. So so I'd been kind of keeping track of these things for a while. You, you know, when you get told, you know, for only. Uh, 20 cents, uh, you can save a child's life or, or something like that uh, in some advertising copy. And I, I knew enough to know that those ones weren't true. My wife actually helped me out a bit with this. Uh, she was a medical student, now, now a doctor. Uh, and she knew that, uh, that the 20 cents in that case is usually the, the cost of the vaccine or something, um, the cost of the actual liquid that goes into the syringe. Uh, but then you also have to pay for the syringes. You have to pay for the, the health workers who get out to the remote villages in order to administer the vaccines. And then bigger than all of that, you have to deal with the fact that, that many people won't get the illness at all. And also uh, that many of the people who get the illness wouldn't die. And so you need this, this number called the number needed to treat, where that tells you how many people do you need to vaccinate in order to prevent the, the suffering from that disease, as an example. And so so I knew that some of these numbers didn't work, uh, but there are other numbers that seem to work um, and to make sense uh, about, you know, very cheap costs for preventing blindness, for example. And so I was, uh, you know, I'd noticed that there seemed to be something like a factor of 10,000 uh, between how much we could achieve for ourselves uh, with our money. That when I say ourselves, uh, you know, I'm speaking of, of people from this kind of uh, privileged background of not so much as to where you fall in the income spectrum uh, in your own country, but particularly people from, say, the UK or Australia or the US, uh, where even the, the median person, like the middle person uh, in the income distribution in those countries are among the, you know, the top uh, percent or two uh, in, in the world income distribution. And so, yeah, so I, I was kind of thinking deeply about these things. And then I was uh, I actually was, was introduced uh, to Jason Matheny, um, who had been an architecture student who had had found a book uh, actually called Disease Control Priorities in Developing Countries, DCP, and in his library at the university, and it changed his life. Uh, and uh, he dropped out of his course and actually went on to help write the second edition of that book. Uh, and that book was all about how cost-effective it can be in order to to help people in poor countries. We're actually trying to do the science on this and work out, you know, okay, really, uh, how much does it cost in order to save a life? Or as they, they more commonly did it, uh, in something like a quality-adjusted life year. So it, it's important that we extend people's lives by a larger amount, not just that they die the next month or something. Uh, and also that that, that extension uh, is in as high a quality of health as possible. And also that that there are things that, that don't involve saving life, such as curing blindness, which take the years in someone's life and make them better. And so by having this idea of a quality adjusted life year, the universe of different ways of helping people with their health that you can compare is much larger. Um, so it's not just like, what's the most effective group for doing this particular health issue? Say, what's the mm -hmm. most effective uh, group for avoiding HIV? Uh, but instead, it can be for, for helping people with health full stop. So he showed me that this book that he'd helped to write, DCP2, and yeah, it, it blew me away, actually. Uh, and coming from a, a maths background, I was delighted to get the data set uh, of all of the, these 108 different ways that they had of, uh, of improving people's health. And I could see this, this actual distribution of, of how much good these different ways could do per dollar. And I found that, that it was just this huge variation, just really massive. Um, and that the, the middle interventions, so the kind of the median, uh, was at around about $300 uh, to give someone a year of healthy life. And that's, that's amazing. Um, if you think about your own life, if, if, uh, if you were going to lose a year of life, uh, unless you paid $300, that, that would, uh, I think, uh, you know, for most people listening, be, be a no brainer. Um, even if it were the case that it was up to a uh, hundred times as much as that, $30,000 per year of life, I think a lot of people would pay that. And one way to look at that is they'd prefer to keep $30,000 after tax, like compared to say, uh, you know, and gain an extra year of life for every year that they do that, mm. um, compared to having a salary of 60000 Uh And so it was like, wow, this is like a, you know, these middle interventions are about a hundred times more effective than, uh, than we'd be willing to pay for health uh, over here. Uh, but then there were other things that were that were ten times as effective as that, 
And then there were some that were even 10 times as effective as that. Mm. And the, the whole span ranged from things which were about as effective as, as we'd pay for in the UK uh, through to things which were about 10,000 times more effective. And some of that variation could be explained by error in the, in the, the methods. Um, maybe, maybe some of it's a bit exaggerated at, at the ends. Uh, but I could also work out that, that that couldn't explain the whole thing because there are examples like the, you know, famous examples like uh, the eradication of smallpox, which were actually more effective than anything that had been uh, studied in this, in this group. So it's not that these numbers were unbelievable. You know, even more amazing things had happened. And so that, that was a real breakthrough for me in terms of understanding this. Yeah, I think... Originally, back back in those early days, uh, you thought of the, the the intellectual project that you were a part of as being positive ethics, if I recall. Okay, yeah, can can you explain uh, what, why you called it that? Yeah. So, and and this this links back to utilitarianism. Um, so, I'd uh, done a lot of study of utilitarianism, and actually, my uh, my BPhil thesis and uh, and and ultimately my doctoral thesis as well were about consequentialism, which is connected. So utilitarianism is a theory that ultimately says two different things. Uh, it says that the first thing it says is that there's only one thing that, that matters, morally speaking, which is that the outcomes are as good as possible. And that principle we call consequentialism. So the idea is that it doesn't matter what motives you had or, or things like that. Um, if you can create better outcomes, that's, that's what matters. And then the second part is the idea that the, what makes an outcome good is purely a matter of uh, uh, the total amount of happiness uh, in that outcome. And, and happiness here is understood usually quite broadly, uh, where it means something like positive experience, even if we wouldn't normally call that experience happiness. Um, and you kind of you know, can subtract off the negative experience or suffering. So it says that what ultimately matters is the total of positive experience in the world. And that's a, that's an idea. It's actually quite broad. You might think that there's a bunch of things that it doesn't capture, but when you actually look at those things, many of them do end up producing more positive experience in the world, uh, the things we value. So the utilitarians, you know, are a group who think that, that actually this captures many of our moral intuitions and that we can ground out the other things we care about, uh, in the increased happiness that they produce. So for example, things like equality and freedom, uh, tend to lead to more happiness as well. So that's, that's utilitarianism. And one thing that was uh, quite special about it is that it says that the positive matters just as much as the negative. Um, so, for example, we normally think of ethics in common sense in terms of these kind of thou shalt not uh, lists, um, lists of prohibitions, you know, things you shouldn't do, you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't cheat, you shouldn't lie. Uh, rather than like, what should you do? <laughs> kind of, you know, more positive uh, duties. And the utilitarians, because they, they had this symmetry between, um, between the positive and the negative, they could notice that if you save 10 lives or if you don't save 10 lives, that's a really big deal. Um, in fact, uh, according to the utilitarian, maybe that, that's equivalent to killing 10 people if you don't save 10 lives. Um, so it's, it's, it's huge. Effectively, the, these facts are about charity and how much we can help. The reason they're so amazing is, is if you're coming from a country uh, that is one of the richest in the world, um, then it, it ultimately shouldn't be that surprising that the very richest uh, people on a global level can do so much with their money um, to help others. Uh, but when you combine those two together, you could see this idea that, that maybe, you know, I didn't want to say uh, that the utilitarians are right about this uh, and that it's just as important. And maybe there are also things that matter beyond good outcomes. Maybe there are certain kind of actions you should never take, um, you know, such as killing someone, no matter how good the consequences are. Mm. But if you don't have to, <laughs> to do any of those things, you don't have to kill, cheat, lie, steal in order to donate money to charity. And in doing so, um, you could save, say, one or 10 or 100 lives uh, during the course of your own career. Then, you know, what I wanted to say was that's a really big deal. Uh, and the utilitarians saw that, but I thought that you don't have to be committed to all of this other stuff that they say uh, in order to see it too. In fact, everyone should kind of agree. Yeah, let's maybe... So what are some of the ways that... Uh, well, I guess we've described one way that utilitarianism is a bit appealing, or at least it's alert to uh, an issue that maybe other streams of thought in moral philosophy uh, haven't had much to say about, which is, you know, not just avoiding doing the wrong thing, but also, you know, what, what good things, uh, you know, what ways could you make the, the world better? What are some of the ways that utilitarianism is uh, a combination of unintuitive and un un unappealing, perhaps? 
Yeah, uh, I think that there are there are two types of ways. Um, I, I think there's actually a nice characterization that while utilitarians only care about producing good outcomes and 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 you know the gooder the better uh, in terms of this, there are two kinds of limits that we normally have in our common sense conceptions of morality, uh, which utilitarianism doesn't have. So the most famous one is that there are normally these limitations, we call them constraints uh, on our actions, uh, that there are certain things that you just shouldn't do, no matter how much better you could make the outcome. And uh, actually, people are somewhat unsure about that in extreme cases. Um, if there is some very extreme case uh, where perhaps through killing someone, you could save your whole city from being uh, killed by a terrorist or something like that. Maybe some, you know, okay, okay. Hang on. So there, there maybe are some cases, uh, but generally there's this idea of a constraint, that there are things that you should never or almost never do in order to make the outcome better. Uh, but And utilitarians uh, don't necessarily agree with that. That said, a thoroughgoing utilitarian would notice uh, that there probably are some pretty bad repercussions involved with uh, with breaking those rules. Um, which in, would include reputational effects um, and also a lot of other kind of more subtle flow-on harms uh, from these things. Uh, so whenever they're trying to be really careful, they, they normally say, yeah, well, actually, we wouldn't recommend breaking any of these rules either, um, but we think that's because of these these more subtle kind of flow-on consequences and reputational effects. Rather than because it's it's wrong in itself. Yeah, that's right. But you you basically never see them in moral philosophy saying, actually, yeah, you should do those things. Uh, that, that almost never happens. Yeah. Uh, but then the other type of limit and the other kind of area where it can give unintuitive answers, I mean, and maybe that first case is actually does give fairly intuitive answers because in the end they say you shouldn't do those things. But th this other kind of limit is uh, what we might call a freedom or a prerogative where usually uh, we think that it's not the case that, that of all the possible things that you could do today, uh, let's say one of them is the optimal one, and that you just have to do that optimal one. Anything else is wrong. Um, so that's what utilitarianism says. And uh, so we tend to think that actually there's, there's certain areas of your life where you should have freedoms about them. Um, and even if it's not optimal, you know, let, let's say there's a choice of how many children you're going to have. Um, let's, let's say between zero, one, two three and uh, we might say it's uh you know this is something where that the intuitive theory of morality says not that you have to kind of think about the consequences of each of those numbers of children and choose on those grounds but rather that you should be free to to have any number um, kind of procreative freedom and so among other things it might say that that if you earn money at a job uh, that you're also free to spend that money on what you want Whereas the utilitarian might say, actually, no, you've got an obligation to use that money on uh, um, wherever you can help people the most. So that, that's another way in which is, it can be unintuitive. Yeah, it's maximally uh, extreme in this dimension because utilitarianism, as normally um, construed, would say that there's one course of action, the very best, that is absolutely mandatory, and everything else, every other deviation from that is completely prohibited, uh, which is, which is quite, quite distinctive relative to most other moral philosophies, I think. That, that's right. Isn't that that there's a third way in which utilitarianism conflicts with most people's intuitions, I'd say, which is just that it says that the only thing that matters is uh, the consequences. And I guess in, if we're talking about utilitarianism as one flavor of consequentialism, it says the only thing that matters, the only thing that has moral value is well-being. And so other things like justice or fairness simply are not moral concepts, or at least that they're not intrinsically valuable. And I think many people find that pretty hard to swallow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I should say that the, the key aspect is that, is this intrinsically valuable? Um, if you actually talk to utilitarians, uh, that they often have very strong pro-equality, pro-freedom, uh, even pro-rights uh, stances, but they think that these things are justified in virtue of their, their follow-on effects on, uh, you know, on happiness, human happiness, but also happiness perhaps more broadly construed across the, the animal world. So, it, it it is a bit tricky. I mean, but you've you've got examples of uh, you know people like uh, John Stuart Mill, you know, a very famous utilitarian, arguing for political liberalism. Uh, you know, probably the most famous proponent of pro political liberalism and the freedoms that that entails, mm. and also arguing uh, very prominently uh, for women's rights um, uh, before the law. And he thought that both things could be founded on the the happiness uh, that would be created. Uh, you've got uh, Jeremy Bentham, uh, another very famous utilitarian, arguing for um, legal protections for animals uh, and better treatment of prisoners. 
In the uh, 18th century, to be In clear. the 18th century, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also decriminalization of homosexuality because he thought it was a victimless crime and so it shouldn't be a crime and so on. So th there was one thing that you can say in general with moral philosophy is that the more extreme theories, which are, um, which are say, less in keeping with, with all of our current uh, moral beliefs, are also less likely to encode like the prejudices of, of our times. And so uh, what we say in the, in the philosophy business is that they've got more reformative power. They've got more ability to actually take us somewhere new and better than where we currently are. Like if we've currently got kind of moral blinkers on and there's some, there's some group who we're not paying proper attention to uh, and their, their plight, then a theory with reformative power uh, might be able to help us uh, actually make moral progress. But it, it comes with the risk of, uh, you know, by having... Uh, more clashes with our intuitions, uh, we will end up perhaps doing things that are, that are more often intuitively bad or wrong, and that they might actually be bad or wrong. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a double-edged sword uh, in this area, and one would have to be very careful when following theories uh, like that. Yeah. So you say in, in your talk that for these reasons, among others, you couldn't uh, embrace utilitarianism, um, but uh, you nonetheless thought that there were some valuable parts of it. Basically, there are some parts of utilitarianism that are appealing and good and other parts that of, of, about which you're extremely wary. And I guess in, in your vision, effective altruism was meant to take the good and leave the, <laughs> leave the bad, more or less. Yeah, can you explain that? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I guess, you know, I certainly, I wouldn't call myself a utilitarian uh, and I you know, don't think that I am. But, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot to admire in it as a moral theory. And I think that, that a, a bunch of utilitarians such as John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham, you know, were, you know, had, had a, a lot of great ideas that really helped move society forwards. But uh, in part of my studies, in fact, what I did after all of this uh, was to start looking at uh, something called moral uncertainty, uh, where you take seriously that <laughs> that we don't know which of these moral theories, if any, uh, is, is the right way uh, to act. And that in some of these cases, if you're, you know, if you've got a bit of doubt about it, you know, it might tell you to do something. A kind of classic example is, uh, is if it tells the surgeon to to kill one patient in order to transplant their organs into five other patients. In in practice, actually, the utilitarians uh, tend to argue that actually the the negative consequences of doing that would actually make it not worth doing. Uh, but in any event, let's suppose there was some situation like that uh, where it suggested that you do it and you couldn't see a good reason not to. That it's still. If you're wrong about utilitarianism, then you know you're probably doing something really badly wrong. You know, or another example would be say killing a million people to save a million and one people. Um, you know, utilitarianism <laughs> okay. might say, well, it's just plus one. You know, that, that's just like saving a life. Uh, whereas uh, every other theory would say this is, this is absolutely this is an uh, terrible. Yeah. Uh, and so, so the idea with moral uncertainty is that you kind of hedge against that, and you you, you uh, in some manner, uh, you know, up for debate as to how you do it. You consider a, a bunch of different moral theories or, or moral principles. And then you think about how convinced you are by each of them. And then you try to look at how they each apply to the situation at hand and work out some kind of uh, best compromise between them. Um, and the kind of simplest kind of view is, let's just pick the theory that you've got the highest credence in and just do whatever it says. But most people who've thought about this don't endorse that. And they think you've got to do something more complicated where you have to, in some ways, mix them together in the, in the case at hand. And so uh, while I think that there is uh, a lot going for utilitarianism, uh, I think that on on some of these most unintuitive cases, they're the cases where I trust at least, and they're also the cases where I think that um, you know the, the other theories that I have some some confidence in uh, would say that it's going deeply wrong, and so I would actually just never be tempted in doing those things. Yeah, it's interesting actually. Before I thought about moral uncertainty, I thought, oh, well, if if I you know if, if I think utilitarianism is a pretty good theory, oh, even if I feel like I shouldn't do those things, uh, my theory is telling me I have to, <laughs> and uh, you know something along those lines. And like there's this kind of weird conflict, whereas it's actually quite a relief uh, <laughs> to uh, to have this this additional humility of well, hang on a second, I don't know wh which theory is right, you know, no one does, uh, and so if the theory would tell you to really go out on a limb and do something that, that could well be terrible, actually a, a more sober analysis suggests, you know, don't do that. Yeah, yeah. I, as, as I understand it, the vision originally was that this positive ethics, which I guess eventually um, came to be called effective altruism, it would basically take the parts of utilitarianism that were largely uncontroversial <laughs> and then basically just scrap all of the parts of it that seemed dangerous or highly controversial. W what was that picture? Yeah, so... You know, here I think uh, you could 
we could isolate something like two different principles, um, which utilitarianism clearly sees and strongly endorses. But we're just going to take those two principles. We're not going to take anything else from the theory. Um, and those principles are that uh, that doing good, you know, say saving a life, uh, really matters. So that from a moral point of view, you know, it's a, it's a key part of living a moral life is to do things like um, helping others if you, if you really can. So that was one part. And I think that, that ultimately everyone can endorse that. Uh, if there was someone whose moral theory said, oh, no, I just can't endorse that, uh, <laughs> helping others is just irrelevant, uh, you know, I, w- I yeah. would look askance at them. Yeah, and to be clear, we're not saying it's mandatory, merely no. that it would be a good thing, all else equal, if you could provide a massive welfare benefit to someone. <laughs> yeah, and, and if, if it turns out that you knew that you could save 100 lives over the course of your own life, and yet you, were, you just didn't, that there would be something that's seriously missed there. That, that's the kind of idea. And that, it's, that it would, or if you did it, that that might be one of the most significant aspects of your life from a moral point of view. So th- that's, that's the first idea. Uh, and then the second idea is one of scale, uh, to say that saving uh, 10 lives is a 10 times bigger deal uh, than saving one life. And saving 100 is, is 10 times bigger still. Uh, so sometimes uh, when it comes to charity, it's it's the, the technical term that philosophers use is that it's uh, super erogatory, which means that that you don't have a duty to do it. Um, it's in some other realm, and if things in that realm they have a tendency to kind of think it doesn't really matter which one of them that you do. Uh, whereas I'm saying actually it does matter a lot, and I, I'm I think it can be. You can miss that if you're thinking about ethics from the perspective of the the agent, um, so that the person who's making the decisions. And for example, if if you think about uh, the idea of the vow of poverty uh, that that medieval monks used to take, uh, that was an idea about kind of ridding yourself of these um, problematic uh, material possessions and the the kind of corruption of your soul uh, that they could produce. Mm. as opposed to an idea about helping others as much as you can uh, so that you need to kind of end up in the situation of poverty yourself, uh, you know, a kind of Singerian case for it. Um, it wasn't like that. And so once you have a focus on the others that you're helping, and, and at least maybe not all your focus should be there, but a substantial amount, then you can see that that if you kind of imagine that these these people who would die, you know, but for for your donation... If you imagine that, that you know, say there's 11 people and if you do the, the first donation, you'll save one of their lives. Um, and if you do the other one, you'll save the other 10 people instead. And you kind of imagine looking at these people and, and talking to them and, and having them kind of able to, to beg you for, for these things. Uh, you know, I, I think that it would be pretty crazy to, to, um, to say you should save the one in that case. Yeah. So that, that was a, a change in, in focus as well. And, and that also led to, led to some other changes. So one of the ideas with Giving What We Can was to be a, a public register of people who've, uh, who've made this commitment to give. And, you know, I agree with, with everyone else uh, that it's somewhat more gauche uh, to give and say that you're giving than to give and not say you're giving. Yeah, it might, might be good to say a little bit more about what, what Giving What We Can is. So sure. I think around this time you're thinking, well, what can people, like, you know, if people think an important part of moral life is, is, is benefiting others, like, you know, what concretely can we build uh, <laughs> this, this group of people uh, around doing? Um, yeah, which led you to start Giving What We Can. It, yeah, exactly. And so, so looking at these, these figures for cost effectiveness uh, made me realize, you know, and, and just kind of, I already partly knew this, but it made me realize just how much we could help with money. So there's, there's lots of things one can do with one's life, uh, but it's actually pretty hard to do something like save 100 lives. But in terms of our, our money, actually, you know, more than half the, the people uh, in the UK, uh, if they wanted to, and made it a, a real commitment over the rest of their life, uh, could save 100 lives. And that, that's somewhat surprising, and it's just, you know, it was worth dwelling on. And so I, I dwelled on this quite a lot and just really kept thinking about it. And one of the changes by thinking about it so much was that I came to see this less from this obligation frame uh, that Peter Singer popularized. And instead to see it more just, I just had a strong desire to to save people's lives if I could. Mm. Um, you know, and I think a lot of us would. It's just, you know, that we think, wow, wouldn't it be amazing to have been in, you know, when we read stories about people who took heroic actions, sometimes they took them at, at massive cost and we're, we're, we don't want to imagine ourselves in that position. But at other times we think, wow, imagine having been able to do this uh, and to help these people. So that that's something where 
you know, which is a bit of a shift of, of focus. Um, so, yeah, one aspect was that shift of focus to, to be thinking more in a direction of, actually, this is just something amazing that we can do. Um, uh, but it's, it's morally significant and weighty, but not just as, ah, oh, damn it, I've got to do that. Then I'll get back to playing my PlayStation or something. But rather, no, actually, this is what it's all about. And that, was the, that was the first one. And then also just, you know, the, the fact that it was money that could do so much good um, and that the what stops this being surprising is just once you realize how uh, seriously unequal the world income distribution is and how uh, the people that, that one would be trying to help are people who have about 100 times less money than people in, in the richer countries. And so it's not that surprising if uh, money goes about 100 times further. Uh, and it turns out that the 100 times richer is already adjusting for the fact that... that um, that money goes further in, in poor countries. If you don't adjust for that, then you'll see that you should expect your money to be able to do about 400 times as much good. And then it's possible to get a bit of extra leverage on that as well by, by choosing to, to help fund things like, uh, say, deworming at schools, where it's a lot more expensive to get it done just for yourself, whereas there are, there are economies of scale when it's done uh, you know, at scale. Yeah. So realizing you know how much good we could do with giving, and that's why there was this focus that I had on starting a new organization for people who just who want to make a personal pledge over the rest of their lives to give at least a, a tenth of everything that they earn each year to help the least fortunate people in the world, where they could do the most good with this, and as part of that to have this focus on on effectiveness as well. Once you could see that that there were some ways of giving this money which would, which would, wouldn't achieve these amazing things, uh, perhaps that would happen if you give to people in your own country. You wouldn't have these huge benefits. Uh, and so to get that focus on giving more and giving more effectively, and because I'd seen this quantitative data on just how effective it can be, uh, then I was able to notice that you know that the average person could quite reasonably give uh, instead of giving about one percent of their income over the rest of their life, give ten percent. So give 10 times more, and then to give it somewhere that's about 10 times more effective. Uh, and if they did both those things at the same time, it wouldn't just be 20 times as good, it would be 100 times as good, because uh, these, these multiply. And so I thought, okay, this is a, a you know, having this package together as, as one idea uh, would be especially valuable. Yeah. So that led to the formation of Giving What We Can, where people would commit to give 10% of their income to, to the most effective charities. So as I understand it, in, in those early days, the, the vision was, we're going to strip away a whole lot of uh, things, that, of a baggage that utilitarianism has. And we're going, to, we're going to say merely that it's good to provide large benefits to other people if it doesn't come at a huge cost to yourself. And it's better to provide even larger benefits. If you can provide 10 times as much benefit to others, then that's, that's roughly 10 times better again. But... We're not going to say, as utilitarianism says, that the only thing that matters in, is well-being, that there are no other moral concerns. Um, that's highly controversial and <laughs> probably wrong. So let's, 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 let's leave that by the side. Uh, we're not going to say that you can take any actions necessarily in order to, to benefit other people. We're just going to say, you know, in as much as you're not violating any of these plausible side constraints, like violating the, the, the rights of other people, then, then you ought to do it. Uh, we're just going to leave this a, a, as an open philosophical question. You know, what, what sort of side constraints do we have and how strong? do they bind yeah uh, uh, that, that's right and, and in fact i would go even further and say rather than describing it as a stripped down version of utilitarianism i'd say we take these these two insights that utilitarianism uh made clear and that's all we're going to take is just these two insights and and we're going to say well hang on a second you know is it is it reasonable for for everyone to agree with those anyway and on inspection i think it is uh they're just things that we should have always come to believe um it just was maybe less obvious with with different approaches to to ethics yeah uh and then to say yeah let, let's build a, a movement around uh these these ideas and in doing so uh we should at least through through our giving be able to do you know something like a hundred times or more good than we were previously able to do uh and then to to be kind of excited about that and to share the ideas about and share the information that that, that scientists economists um, health researchers had had developed about the places where we can do a lot of good for others yeah i guess was effective altruism at the time kind of construed as a theory of normative ethics, or was it was it more analogized to to, to something else? Yeah, so at that time uh, <laughs> there wasn't quite effective altruism. There, there was giving what we can, um, and uh, I had met uh, Will McCaskill in uh, two thousand and nine in April, uh, and then over the next uh, seven months uh, we'd worked really hard together and. Uh, 
uh, taken a whole lot of these ideas I'd already developed around an organization that would become given what we can and, and actually just making it happen. Uh, so we were doing that. And then in the, the years after that, the next couple of years, I was, uh, you know, thinking academically around this more general idea of not just when it comes to giving, uh, but when it comes to, to lots of moral thought about our lives, about, uh, you know, what, what we just called uh, positive ethics. So, so that was the, the kind of thinking there. Uh, and at a similar time, uh, 2011, I think, Will uh, and uh, Ben Todd gave a talk about ethical career choice, um, applying these ideas to, to career choice. They worked together and, uh, and founded 80,000 Hours, uh, ultimately, you know, brought in other people as well and, and really took those ideas to their, their conclusions. And then once we had uh, the, these two organizations, uh, giving what we can, uh, thinking about what we can do with our incomes and 80,000 hours, thinking about what we can do with our careers, uh, it was even more important to, to have some word that referred to all of this. And so uh, as a practical matter, we needed to set up a charity uh, within the Charity Commission in the UK. Uh, and we wanted to just do that once uh, and set up a, you know, an umbrella that, that both these organizations could exist under. And so we ended up uh, having a, a big vote on that to try to, to try to pick the name for this. And we ended up picking uh, the, the Center for Effective Altruism. And the idea behind that uh, was that in naming it, we would probably also be naming this, this nascent movement uh, that, that people were, were really starting to get excited about. Did you imagine that this would become like viewed as a moral philosophy or was it, was it more, more like environmentalism or some other a- attitude or disposition or concern that people have that, that, isn't, <laughs> that isn't viewed as like an actual theory of ethics? Yes. So even when I was thinking of it as, a, um, as an academic project under the label of uh, positive ethics, it was still a very, a very broad uh, project that could encompass many different theories. In fact, I, I was suggesting that any, you know, any moral theory uh, worth its salt, uh, you know, should be endorsing these kinds of ideas. Uh, and in, in some ways, you could think of that a bit similarly to the, the philosophical ideas behind environmentalism or feminism, where we're saying that, that women really matter. I and mean, that's the kind of distinctive idea, uh, that they matter just as much as men, uh, that we're just all people. And, uh, or environmentalism saying that, that these non-human aspects of the environment, certainly animal lives, perhaps also, uh, plant life, uh, that this is a, something that also has, has some kind of normative weight, uh, to it. And in both those cases, they're not a particular moral theory or something. There's not just like one uh, particular kind. And, you know, feminists and environmentalists also care about heaps of other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they come to the table with other moral commitments. You know, maybe they're, they're uh, a Christian or a Muslim uh, or an atheist with a particular moral view, or, they, or they've never really thought that much about other aspects of morality, but they, they you know, if you push them, they'd have a bunch of ideas. Uh, and they're just coming together because they support just enough principles to have some things in common with these other people to, to fight for something that they care about. Uh, and ultimately, uh, that's how I see effective altruism, whether viewed as a, as a philosophy, um, like, like the kind of philosophy of environmentalism, or whether viewed as a social movement. Okay, so that's uh, a whole lot of history about the the motivation behind uh, you know naming and trying to to get the ball rolling uh, on on this idea of uh, of effective altruism. Let's maybe get back to some of the broader lessons from moral philosophy that you were prompted to reflect on more uh, by the collapse of of FTX. There's three in the keynote that you gave at Effective Altruism Global. Um, firstly, there's the harm that comes from going all in on, on just one theory. Then there's the need to assess everything, not just not just acts uh, on their consequences. And then there's uh, having a model for how personal character and integrity can be really important, even if they don't vary uh, nearly as widely as uh, do, you know, say the importance or the pressingness of causes or the effectiveness of different interventions. Let's do the first one first, because it was my, my, my single favorite one. It made me really light up when I was watching it, because it, uh, it was one of the cases where you're like, ah, I should have, I should have seen this <laughs> before, but, uh, but now, I, now I clearly do. And this is the... Um, the issue that there are huge risks that come with trying to get 100% of what uh, any moral theory uh, wants without any, any compromises. Yeah, can you explain uh, h- how that is? Yeah, here's uh, a uh, thought experiment. You've got three different options available to you, right? So option A is uh, to save one life, which is pretty good. Um, option B is to save 99 lives. 
and option C is to save 100 lives. So the classical approach uh, in utilitarianism is to say, well, we look at each of those things and we see which one has the best outcome and it's saving 100 lives. And then we say that that's what you have to do. Uh, but there's also a uh, development within consequentialism called scalar consequentialism, which says that actually it's a bit of a mistake to try to connect it with rightness or obligation quite so quite such a binary way. And in, in fact, I think that the earliest utilitarians, such as Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, actually don't speak like that. They tend not to say that you know only the best thing is the is the right or acceptable thing. They tend to say things, uh, you know, John Stuart Mill says that an act is right in proportion to the uh, the goodness of the consequences it creates. Hmm. And I think that that is a better way of thinking. And uh, it's something where modern consequentialists uh, have really started leaning in that direction. And, and call, they call it scalar consequentialism, where the idea is, is that um, how right or, or important these different options are is in proportion to the goodness uh, that they create. And so the really important thing in this case is that you don't do option A. Um, that's where the really big gap is. Uh, rather than saying C is like is uniquely interesting and important uh, because it's the best, uh, it says, well, actually, B is pretty similar to C, 99 lives, 100 lives. Uh, and the real gulf is between that and A. Uh, and so if you were going to just kind of compress things down to a simple thing, it wouldn't be do C, it would be don't do A. Yeah. Okay, so basically it, it would be a mistake to think that, that the big difference is between saving 100 lives and saving either 99 or 1. Rather, the big difference is between saving one life and 99 or 100. That, that feels uh, very intuitive, <laughs> I think, to most people because it's far, far closer to how we think about decisions in, in real life. Yeah, and, and there's a, a key aspect there. It, you know, it comes from a, a practical point, which is that you know, in, in that stylized example, that was the only thing that mattered and the only thing that there was, was saving these lives. But in reality, the different options involve other kinds of effects in the world. Uh, and perhaps those effects matter. Um, so you might have a, you know, a moral theory that includes things other than happiness. And maybe uh, in, in trying to res absolutely maximize out on happiness, uh, you start doing damage uh, to some of these other things. Yeah. So, so what goes wrong when you try to go from, you know, doing doing most of the good that you can to trying to do the absolute maximum? Yeah. So the, here's how I think of it: is that even on, uh, let's say, utilitarianism, if you try to do that, you generally get diminishing returns. So you could imagine kind of trying to ramp up the amount of optimizing that you're doing uh, from zero percent to a hundred percent, and as you do so, uh, the the value that you can create starts going up uh, pretty steeply at the start. Uh, but then it starts kind of tapering off uh, as you've used up a lot of the the best opportunities and and there's there's fewer things that that you're actually able to bring to bear in order to help improve the situation as you get towards the end. You, you've already used up the good opportunities, right? Uh, but then it, it gets even worse when you consider other moral theories. Um, so if you've got moral uncertainty, as as I think you should, uh, and you also have some some credence that you know maybe there are some other things that fundamentally matter apart from happiness or, or whatever your you know the theory that you like most says. Well, there are these trade offs uh, as you optimize for the for the main thing. Uh, there can be these trade offs to these other components um, that get steeper and steeper as you get further along. So maybe um, suppose uh, as well as uh, happiness, uh, it also matters how much you achieve in your life or something like that. Uh, then it may be that that many of the ways that you can improve happiness, uh, let's say in this case, involve kind of achievements, perhaps achievements in terms of charity and achievements in terms of going out in the world and accomplishing stuff. But as you get further, you can start to get these trade-offs between the two. And uh, it can be the case uh, that for this other thing, that it starts going down. Uh, maybe if instead we were comparing uh, happiness first and then freedom, uh, maybe the the ways that you could create the most happiness involve, uh, all, you know, it, when you try to crank up that optimization right to 100%, you're just giving up everything else uh, if need be. And so maybe there could be massive sacrifices uh, in terms of freedom or other things right at the end there. Yeah. Uh, and perhaps a, 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 like a real world example to make that concrete is if you think about, say, trying to become a good athlete. Uh, maybe uh, you've taken up running and you want to, you know, get faster and faster times and, and you know, achieve well in that. Uh, as you start uh, doing more running, uh, you know, the, your fitness goes up and you're also feeling pretty good about it. Uh, you've, you know, got a new exciting kind of mission in your life and you, you can see your time's going down and it makes you happy and excited. Uh, and so a lot of metrics are going up at the start. 
Uh, but then if you keep pushing it and you make running faster times the only thing you care about and, uh, and you're willing to give up anything uh, in order to get that faster time, uh, then you may well, you know, to, to get the absolute optimum, like of all the lives that you could live, if you only care about the life that has the, the best uh, kind of running time, uh, it may be that you end up making massive sacrifices in relationships and, and other aspects or career, uh, or in that case, helping people. Uh, so you can see that it's a kind of generic concept. And I think that the reason it comes up is that we've got all of these different opportunities uh, for improving this, this metric that we care about. And we kind of sort them in some kind of order from like the ones that they give you the biggest bang for their buck through to the, the ones that give you the least. And in doing so, you know, at the end of that list, there are some ones that just give you a very marginal benefit, but absolutely trash a whole lot of other metrics uh, for your life. And so if you're only tracking that one thing, uh, if you go all the way to those very final options, uh, while it does make your, your primary metric go up, it can make uh, these other ones that you weren't tracking go down steeply. Yeah. So, so the basic idea is if there's multiple different things that you care about. So we'll talk about, yeah, happiness in life versus, you know, everything else that you care about, you know, having good relationships, uh, achieving things, helping others, say. Early on, when you, when you think, well, how can I be happier? You take the low-hanging fruit where you do things that make you happier in some sensible way that don't come at massive cost to the, to the rest of your life. And why is it that when you go from trying to achieve you know, 90% of the happiness that you could possibly have to 100%, it comes at this massive cost to everything else? It's because those are the things that you were most loath to do, <laughs> is to you know, just give up your job and start taking heroin all the time. You didn't want, you didn't want, that was extremely unappealing, and you wouldn't do it unless you were absolutely uh, only uh, focused on well-being or on happiness because that's it's <laughs> you're giving up such an incredible amount exactly and, and this is a you know is this closely related to the problem uh with targets uh in government uh where you you pick a couple of things like hospital waiting times uh and you you target that and uh, at, at first the target does you know a pretty good job uh but when you're really just kind of sacrificing everything else such as quality of care in order to get those people through the waiting room as quickly as possible then actually you're shooting yourself in the foot with this target yeah and there's the, the same kind of issue uh is one of the arguments for um for risk from ai if we try to include a lot of things into what the AI would want to optimize, and you know maybe we we hope we've got everything that matters in there, uh, we better be <laughs> we better be right because if we're not, and there's something that that mattered that we left out or that we've got the balance between those things wrong, uh, then as it completely optimizes, uh, things could move from oh you know the, the system's working well, everything's getting better and better to uh, things have gone catastrophically badly. I think uh, Holden Karnofsky, I, I think maybe even on the show, uh, uh, used this term, uh, maximization is perilous. And uh, I like that. I, I think that that captures both what's one of these big problems if you have an AI agent that is maximizing something, and if you have a uh, a human agent, uh, <laughs> um, uh, perhaps a, a friend or, or, or you yourself, uh, who, is, uh, who is just maximizing one thing. Uh, whereas if you just ease off a little bit on the maximizing, <laughs> then you've got a strategy that's much more robust. Yeah, I think effective altruism is associated with this phrase, doing the most good. And seeing this, uh, your, your talk made me think, maybe we should switch that to do most of the good that you can, <laughs> because there you're getting most of the value, because you're, you're, you know, you're above 50% of your potential. But it means that you, you have to give up so much less <laughs> in the rest of your life, and it seems way more sustainable, like much more plausible that you might be able to get above 50% of your potential and be satisfied with that than to try to reach 100%, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> I, I, I like it. I, I think we may still need a bit more um, bit more work on the marketing, uh, but right, it, yeah. it certainly sounds like a, a very distinctive claim. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> do most of the good or EA, you know, eighty twenty it uh, <laughs> in terms of doing good. Yeah, but I think it, it is getting at something. A and I had actually always been a bit frustrated by some of these um, maximizing framed uh, slogans or or you know, ways of expressing the point. Because it always seemed to me that that the real key thing is that is that we're trying to get in the ballpark of the best outcomes. And that that's really what it's what it's all about. And, and you know, one of the things I, I mentioned in the talk actually is, you know, strive for excellence rather than perfection. And, and I think that that is like a, you know, a, perhaps a way of summarizing some of this. Uh, like if there's good life advice on a lot of different dimensions. But I, I think another a kind of subtle way that it's true is that striving for excellence 
tells you, you know, it, it helps you think, hang on, maybe I shouldn't be satisfied with how much everyone else achieves on this thing. Maybe I can just do way better. You know, maybe when it comes to times for running races, well, you, you probably are pretty close to the limits. Uh, but for, for some other things, you know, maybe you could actually do 10 times better than anyone who's ever done before uh, by thinking outside the box and, and working out some new way to do it. And so it incentivizes really t- taking the things you care about and trying to do amazing at them. Whereas the perfection mindset feels like you've just got a couple of percentage points left to go and you're just trying to like get them done. Uh, and it can lead to a kind of, you know, penny wise, pound foolish type behavior uh, where, yeah, you just, uh, you can't see the forest for the trees. Yeah. I think that, that the, the excellence uh, approach, you know, uh, fits the EA mindset better. Yeah. So, so one way that real life deviates from the schema where you're just like choosing between saving one life, 99 lives and 100 lives is that we care about multiple different values. We care about more things than merely saving lives. The picture is more complicated. There's also uncertainty about what effects your actions are going to have. And one reason why you might have serious reservations about a course of action is that it carries with it enormous volatility, enormous uncertainty about about the, the effect that it's going to have. So I, I think another way that that, this can, that you might go wrong if you're just absolutely maximizing the expected value of something without any compromises is that those last few things that you do might be extremely risky. They might have like positive expected value, but bring with them enormous risk of downside. And so you might expect recklessness is, is this sort of thing that would, that would result from being completely uncompromising in, in the pursuit of just one goal. Yeah, that that's, can be especially true uh, if the thing that you're trying to maximize, you know, has within it uh, a claim that you should be trying to maximize the expected value. There are different attitudes you can take to risk, and different ways that that we can we can conceptualize like that. What does optimal behavior look like in a world where we're not certain of of uh, what outcomes will result from our actions? And this is studied in ethics and in decision theory, and you know, the study of rationality within philosophy. And expected value is uh, is probably the, the most dominant theory, uh, which says that you should weight the outcomes by their probabilities that they occur. Uh, but there are other approaches that involve being uh, more risk averse than that, uh, which also have some credibility. And I, I think we should have some uncertainty around these things. Uh, and we should certainly be be risk averse about things like money that have diminishing marginal value. Uh, perhaps another way that one can uh, can go wrong, in fact, is suppose you had just you thought. Uh, that money mattered a lot and was very valuable because money could be used to produce the the end that you're that you're seeking in the world. Um, no matter what charity it is, you could you could uh, you could earn money and then give it. Uh, but then you'd get an extreme version of this because ultimately, if there are diminishing returns on this money, then if you're risk neutral about money, uh, then that's a, a big mistake. Mm. You know, if there are diminishing returns on something, then that implies that that you need to be. Uh, risk averse about it. And and people can often forget that. Yeah. So this obviously makes sense if you're uncertain about what is valuable or you do just directly value multiple things yourself. But yeah, in the talk, you explain how this this is still uh, very important, even if you only personally only care about one thing. Can, can you explain how that is? Yeah. Uh, so so suppose you're you're completely certain and uh, you think only uh, happiness matters. Uh, so you're not worried about the moral uncertainty case. You're not worried about uh, this idea that other things might go down in that last 1% of optimization because you think this is really is the only thing that matters. Well, uh, at least if you're interested in effective altruism, uh, then you're part of a movement that involves people who care about other things uh, and you're trying to work with them towards, uh, uh, towards helping the world. And so this last kind of bit of optimization that you're doing would be very uncooperative uh, with the other people who are part of that movement. So this can be connected to a broader idea that I've written about uh, called moral trade, where the idea there is just as people often exchange goods or services uh, in order to make both of them better off. You know, this is the idea that that Adam Smith talked about. Um, if you if you pay uh, the baker for some bread, uh, you're making this exchange because you both think that that you're better off uh, with the thing the other person had, and. You could do that not just about your self-interested preferences, but with your moral preferences. And in fact, the the theory of trade works equally well in that context. Uh, So for example, suppose there were two friends, uh, one of whom used to be a vegetarian, uh, but had stopped doing it uh, because maybe they got disillusioned with, uh, with some of the arguments about it. Uh, But they'd kind of gone off meat to some degree anyway, and so it wouldn't be too much of a burden if they went back to being a vegetarian. 
they also, uh, that person cares a lot about global poverty and their friend cares about uh, uh, factory farming and uh, vegetarianism. Mm. Well, they could potentially make a deal and say, okay, if you go back to being a vegetarian, I will uh, do this d- donating to this, uh, this charity that you keep telling me about. And they might n- each not be quite willing to do that on their own kind of moral views, uh, but to think that, that if the other person changed their behavior as well, uh, that the world really would be better off. And you can even get cases where, where they've got diametrically opposed views. Uh, perhaps there's some big issue such as abortion or gun rights or something where people have, have, you know, diametrically opposed positions and there are charities which are diametrically opposed. And they're both thinking of donating, um, to a pair of charities which are opposed with each other. And then, you know, that maybe they catch up for dinner and notice that this is going to happen. And they say, hang on a second. How about if instead of both donating $1,000 to this thing, uh, we instead donate our $2,000 uh, to a charity that, that while not as high on our, our list of priorities for charities, one that we actually both care about, and then instead of these, these effects basically cancelling out, uh, we'll be able to produce uh, good in the world. So that, that's the general idea of, of moral trade. And you can see why the, the moral trade would be a good thing if it's the case that even though people have different ideas about what's right, and, and these ideas can't all be correct, if they're, they're generally more often than not kind of pointing in a similar direction or something, uh, such that when we, we better satisfy the overall moral preferences of the people in the world, I think we've got some reason to expect the world to be getting better uh, in that process, in which case uh, moral trade would be a good thing. And uh, it's, yeah, an idea that can also lead to that kind of behavior where you don't do that last little bit of, of maximizing. Yeah. Yeah, we'll stick up a link to your paper on moral trade. There's a bunch of practical issues which I think cause it to be less common um, than than it might be. You, you could imagine, for example, these two extremely opposed political groups, maybe they don't often meet up <laughs> for dinner to, to have conversations <laughs> about how they could both uh, stop stop competing in politics and do something that they both regard as almost as valuable as what they would do otherwise. There's also this issue that uh, if you're paying someone not to do something that you think is bad, but they don't think is bad, then you worry that you might incentivize people to claim that they're going to do that thing anyway in order to get paid not to do it. Uh, so that can be another another practical challenge. But but the underlying idea that people can make deals where they'll stop doing something that they don't care about, but that someone else thinks is really bad in, in exchange for the other person doing doing the reverse, that there's potential benefits to, to all parties here is 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 kind of kind of mind blowing, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, I was I was pretty excited about it, and it would be it would be fun if people uh, if took it up more. You know, I get into these challenges in the papers. Uh, people can can have fun seeing all the problems. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, an interesting one is that there's this problem when you're making a trade with uh, the baker. You need to be sure that if you give them the money, they'll give you the bread. And generally, we've got a functioning society where that works out, and we don't have to put them into escrow or something. We can just <laughs> you know just hand <laughs> over the the things. Um, and we don't really care which order we do it in. So that's one issue, is knowing that, that if you give the thing, they will give you their thing. But there's this interesting extra case with moral trade where you have to know that if you hadn't given them the thing, they wouldn't do their part. Um, and so w- that doesn't come up with the baker. We know that if you hadn't given the baker the money, they wouldn't have given you the bread. But when it comes to, say, donating to that third charity, the compromise charity, uh, they might give you a receipt showing you that they've donated a thousand pounds to that charity. Uh, but then you think, well, hang on, <laughs> maybe they were already going to donate to that charity right. and, yes. yeah, and yeah. they haven't done an extra thing for me. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's another kind of problem. Th- th- there are a few of these challenges that come up. I think that in some cases they, they can be dealt with, especially in cases where where the two parties are just pretty trusting of each other. And, and it's a bit harder for it to happen between complete strangers uh, and a bit easier to happen in cases where, say, with with a friend or something like that. Yeah, I guess just to um, tie back how this is connected to to what we were talking about, you were talking about cooperation within a social movement, say uh, effective altruism, but it would apply more broadly. Mm -hmm. But of course, we're all part of this enormous world full of other people who potentially care about what we're doing. And one reason why you might be reluctant to take a course of action is that because it's so monomaniacally extreme in one dimension, other people are going to massively disapprove of it and think that you're you're doing something that's that's really wrong or, or really really mistaken or, or wrong on, on their point of view. And so there's very good reasons if you want to exist in a society where people generally treat one another with courtesy and are concerned about the views of of others that you want to cultivate a temperament in which you're you're not so monomaniacal that you uh, completely disregard uh, the values of other people and give no weight to their concerns about about what you're doing. 
Yeah, that's right. And uh, uh, I think sometimes people kind of, I, I don't even know if they want to think this, but they feel a bit compelled uh, to think, oh, maybe we need to be a kind of Machiavellian do-gooding society that's, that's you know, trying to do good, you know, above all else and uh, and perhaps in very uncooperative ways. Uh, but that, you know, no one really wants to do that. And uh, and our, I think our best theories don't tell us to do that either. I think that they instead tell us to kind of strive to be to be a community of people who are earnestly trying to be good people as well as trying to do good in the world. Uh, and that I think that that's often quite an easy trade-off to make. Maybe trying to be a good person while also being a shrewd business person is a difficult trade-off. But actually, in this case, I think it tends to work quite well. We shouldn't lose sight of the idea that we're that we really care about others and about making a really big positive difference. But also, we shouldn't go anywhere near really uh, the, the edges of behavior that that is thought to be seriously problematic. Uh, in fact, in the precipice, I wrote uh, a comment like that. I said one of my pieces of advice was uh, don't act without integrity. When something immensely important is at stake and others are dragging their feet, people feel licensed to do whatever it takes to succeed. We must never give in to such temptation. A single person acting without integrity could stain the whole cause and damage everything we hope to achieve. I stand by that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, yeah. I wish uh, wish people like, like Sam had uh, actually taken this kind of advice. Yeah, I think... Quite a lot of people said things like that. Indeed. Yeah, we could quote a whole bunch of them. I, I suppose it could have been more prominent, I suppose. You know, there's lots of points that people can make. And that was, you know, one point among many different uh, observations that people made about how one ought to behave and how one might do more good. I feel like really, really the problem, though, is that there are many people who will hear exhortations like that and think like, yes, that sounds right. Uh, that's the way that I'm inclined to, to behave anyway. And now uh, and I'm glad that people who I look up to are telling me to behave with integrity. But some people just aren't interested in hearing exhortations uh, about integrity from others. They do it doesn't ring true to them for some reason, or it just like doesn't fit with their personality very well. And those folks, you know, you could say it twice as often, but it's just kind of going to go in one ear and out the other. And it just makes it very tricky to coordinate a group of people and make sure that no one ever does anything bad. Because, uh, you know, there's just like, there's a 1% of people who are most inclined to do things that are bad, and they're just very hard to reach. Yeah, I think that 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 is a big challenge. Uh, but one way that you can you can try to deal with it is if we're clear enough about these norms, then it should also be somewhat clear that you shouldn't associate too much or follow people who are breaking these norms if you can tell that they are. Yeah, or, or give positions of power and influence to people who seem sketchy, basically. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and so, oh, obviously, if if someone you know, does something terrible, uh, then we're going to call them out and not follow them or or boost them. But I think that that one needs to draw an even larger border around those kind of dangerous people and and to say it's it's true that you know to some extent there's a kind of uh, you know innocent until proven guilty, but there's a different kind of measure or standard that's needed uh, for like say joining someone's organization or trying to uh, to promote their work. So I, I think that. We should be more careful about that. And it's not that if you think someone's a bit sketchy, you need to kind of whisper to everyone that, you know, they're sketchy and, and, and so forth. But, you know, uh, maybe don't be afraid to, to say that if someone's asking or thinking about, uh, you know, joining their, their organization and saying, you know, I'm not sure about their integrity it is different to actually accusing them of, of things and so on. And so, so I think that, that we might be able to get something to work around that, that that's not just a kind of, that doesn't descend into being some kind of rumor campaign or something like that, but but it does involve sharing a bit of information as to whether we think that that someone seems to be unimpeachable or or whether the uh, it's perhaps the other way around. Yeah. Okay. Let's push on and talk about another lesson that relates to how how we should actually make decisions in the real world uh, when, when we're trying to do good. First, can you explain what naive utilitarianism is? Yeah. So. Many people think that utilitarianism tells us, you know, when we're making decisions, to sit there and, and calculate for each of the possible options available to you uh, how much happiness it's going to create, um, and then to pick the one that leads to the best outcome. Now, if you haven't encountered this before, you may think that that's exactly what I said earlier, <laughs> that, <laughs> that utilitarianism is. But I, I hope I didn't uh, make this mistake uh, back then, and uh, I think I probably got it right. So naive utilitarianism is treating the standard of what leads to the best happiness as a uh, decision procedure. It's saying that the way we should make our decisions is in virtue of that. Whereas 
actually what utilitarianism says is that it's it's a criterion of rightness for different actions. So it's it's the kind of the gold standard, the ultimate arbiter of whether you did act rightly or wrongly. Uh, but it may be that in attempting to do it, you systematically fail. And there's this can be made clear, there's something called the paradox of, of hedonism, where even just in your own life, suppose you, you, you think that uh, having more happiness makes your life go better. Uh, and so you're always trying to have more happiness. Uh, and so every day when you get up, you're like, oh, what would make me happy today? You know, and then you think, which, which of these breakfast cereals would make me happiest? And then you're having it and you're like, would chewing it slower make me happier? Uh, <laughs> uh, and so on. Well, you're probably going to end up with less happiness uh, than if you were just doing things a bit more normally. Um, and uh, it's not really a paradox. It's just that uh, constantly thinking about uh, some particular standard uh, is not always the best way to achieve it. And that was known to the early utilitarians. Uh, in fact, they wrote about this uh, quite eloquently. So they suggested that uh, there, there could be other decision procedures uh, which are better ways of making our decisions. Um, so it mm. could be that even on utilitarian standards, more happiness would be created if we made our decisions in some other way. Uh, perhaps if if we are trying this naive approach of always calculating what would be best, our biases will creep in. And so we'll tend to uh, to distribute benefits to people like us mm -hmm. uh, instead of to those perhaps who actually would need it more. Uh, indeed, there is a lot of opportunity for that, including your self-serving biases. Um, you might think, oh, actually, you know, that 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 nice uh, thing that my friend has uh, would create more happiness if I had it. And so I'm just going to swipe it on the, on the way out the door. Mm. You know, the concern is that that actually <laughs> there is quite a lot of this uh, self-regarding and, and in-group bias uh, with people. And so if they were all trying to directly apply this criterion and to treat it as a decision procedure, uh, they probably would do worse than they would do uh, under some other some other methods. And for a thoroughgoing utilitarian, well, the best decision procedure is whichever one it would be that would lead to the, the most happiness. If that turns out to be to make my decisions like a Kantian would, if that really would lead to, to more of what I value, then I guess, you know, fine, I, you know, I don't, don't have a problem with it. Uh, and so one thing that's, that's quite interesting is that utilitarianism, in some sense, is in less conflict than people might think with other moral theories, because the other moral theories are normally trying to provide a way of making the decisions. I see. Whereas utilitarianism is potentially open to agreeing with them about their way of making decisions, if if that could be grounded in the idea that it produces more happiness. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we're, we're talking about this distinction between criterion of rightness and decision procedure in the context of utilitarianism. But I imagine that a similar phenomenon would show up almost regardless of your goal or regardless of the moral philosophy, that the way of achieving the goal that's specified might not be to think about that goal all the time. You might need some different process to actually exist in the world in order to, in order to get there. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that everyone, <laughs> yeah, for both your own life and also for any moral theory, I think you need to have this distinction. Uh, in kind of classic philosopher style, one could imagine kind of like very unrealistic but, uh, but clear thought experiments where, you know, if, if someone could tell how you were making decisions, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, by, by measuring your, your brain activity or something, and they said that they were going to cause huge amounts of suffering to, let's say, to yourself in, in the future, if... Uh, you make decisions according to a particular method, uh, <laughs> then I would like to hope that you will stop making them according to that method, um, or, or if they were going to cause even suffering to other people because of how you're making your decisions, that you would think, huh, uh, you know, it, I guess actually it would be better if I temporarily or permanently switched to making them in a different method uh, and better by some other lights. And so I think that all moral philosophers or, you know, just general people, you know, it's useful to, to keep this distinction in mind, that there's the question of how ought I practically to, to make my decisions, and then there's a question of which actions would be right. And, and a distinctive thing about consequentialism, or at least like this, what I think is the best version of it, global consequentialism, is to say we use the same kind of standard for both things. So we, when we're saying which is the best act or the right act, you know, we assess it in terms of how good the outcome is. And that if we're saying which is the best way to make our decisions, we assess that by what would be the outcome if we made our decisions in that way. Yeah. Okay. So many people will have heard, I suppose, of act utilitarianism, which is this idea that, you know, for every action that you could take, you decide whether it's right or wrong or decide how good it is based on the consequences that it has. And then there's this 
you know, that, that produces various problems where you might be inclined to violate uh, various social conventions uh, if you think that they have better consequences. So one reaction to that that the people have had is to say, no, what we should evaluate is not each individual action, but rather rules, uh, like principles of behavior. And we should assess, you know, if in general one follows this, this kind of rule in life, does that produce uh, better consequences? And I think uh, global consequentialism is this ex- extension to say, well, everything plausibly, uh, everything could, could be evaluated based on this criteria of whether it's conducive to well-being, not just rules, but also, you know, social institutions or uh, someone's character or dis- dispositions. A- am I understanding it right? Yeah, you are. Um, and uh, yeah, you can kind of include everything. I think in, in some of the famous papers on this, uh, said, you know, sewer systems, uh, <laughs> climates, you know, and, uh, you know, just try to apply really everything. Um, uh, and anything that you're trying, any kind of thing you're trying to evaluate, basically, the idea is to think of all the things of that kind that we could have, go through them, you know, perhaps like one by one. This is an idealized way. It's not that you practically do this. Um, that was the, the whole point of what we're talking about. Mm. Uh, but that, that what determines whether something is, say, the right social system uh, or right, let's say the right way of electing political representatives, what determines that is if you imagine all the different ways we could do it uh, and then if we happen to know uh, what the consequences of those would be, uh, that the one that has the best consequence is the best method. Yeah, That's the idea of setting the gold standard, even if we can never actually be in a situation where we have enough information to be fully sure of it. Yeah, so what sort of extra insights might we get uh, from this switch from evaluating only acts on the consequences, but about being willing to evaluate everything uh, in terms of, terms of the consequences that it has? Yeah, so I think uh, there's there's a couple, I mean, while, while we can, one can assess any kind of thing in this way, <laughs> actually, I... I, I noticed uh, recently someone set up a website uh, where for literally assessing anything, uh, they, they just pick pairs of things, uh, probably from Wikipedia, <laughs> and you just vote on which one's better, uh, whether it be presidential candidates or political systems or, um, uh, you know, or brands of toothpaste or, or yeah, whatever. Vegetables, yeah. <laughs> uh, and just trying to come up with an ordering of all things. Uh, I think that's going a bit too far. And actually, uh, I think even as a very, you know, uh, as an advocate of within consequentialism, I think the global versions are the best. I, I think only things of within one category can be compared. <laughs> so, uh, or at least that it would be good to only do to restrict ourselves in that way. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what it means if you if you go beyond that. Um, yeah. But let's say we're thinking about these things now. Some of these things we could assess are still pretty trivial. You know, what is the what's the right Pokemon or you know or something like that? Uh, <laughs> you know, for me to have yeah. like a toy of in my bedroom or something. And you go, well, of all the Pokemon, it, it's not it's not it's not very fertile kind of line of thought. Uh, it's yeah. not going to lead to much of an outcome. Uh, whereas there are other things uh, that turn out to be very important to, to think about, other categories. And I think that we can really get a good grip on that if, if we really take a step back in moral philosophy and look at these, these three great traditions uh, of moral philosophy. So there's consequentialism, which we've already talked about. And then there's another one is deontology, uh, and Kantianism is a, is a famous example. And this is sort of rule, rules-based ethics? Yeah, exactly. The, the idea there is that there's these rules or principles which are kind of unbreakable. Um, the Ten Commandments would be another example that's familiar to people. Uh, so there are certain kinds of unbreakable principles, and ethics is fundamentally about following uh, such rules that govern our behavior. And, you know, I think that if, if you... That seems a kind of like a plausible account of what ethics is. If you're just telling a person who was like, what's the word ethics mean? It's, it's the rules that govern our behavior or something. Um, and similarly with the consequentialists where they say, uh, it's about, you know, creating outcomes that, that are overall better for people. Mm. Um, and you're like, oh, okay. Uh, it also seems plausibly what it's about. And then the third area is, is that it's about being a good person. Um, so it's about having the right kind of character. So embodying uh, various virtues. And I think, again, you know, ethics is about being a good kind of person uh, is, again, a pretty plausible understanding of, uh, of what it's all about. And that's partly what leads to the conflict between these views, because when you're, when you're really thinking about your own one, you're like, well, how could it be anything else? <laughs> and one of the interesting features, as I said, with consequentialism is it's kind of asking these questions at a slightly different level to the others, because it, you know, it could say, well, actually, we could assess rules. And, uh, you know, I'm just saying that the, the best set of rules uh, are the set of rules that lead to the best outcomes. Um, and maybe that's the set of rules that you're, um, you're going on about. And also that the the right virtues or the you know the character traits uh, that if you were to possess them would be ideal. 
that we could assess those in terms of the consequences they lead to. So the, that a character trait is counts as a virtue if it systematically leads to better outcomes. Uh, and so th- this idea of global consequentialism has this kind of ability to step up a level and you know, hopefully, uh, to capture the best of those three uh, three great traditions all at once. And it does seem to me that that these traditions really did focus on pretty important areas, uh, rules governing behavior, or perhaps a generalization of rules, which which I call decision procedures. And then also thinking about the, the kind of character that one has. These are both very general things which govern a lot of what happens. Um, you could think in some ways of rules as being the things or decision procedures as being the things that govern kind of conscious choice uh, of outcomes and as character traits as as being these kind of more fundamental things kind of behind the scenes that govern the kind of unconscious choice of what you do. Yeah. So as I understand it, you wrote your PhD thesis on on this topic of, of global consequentialism and trying to... That's right. Yeah, maybe trying to unify different areas of moral philosophy using this this concept. Have people who work within the tradition of deontology or virtue ethics uh, accepted that they're just subfields <laughs> of global consequentialism, or do, do, do they do they still think that there's some distinctive things that they're bringing? You know, I don't think that they they have accepted that. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there, there's a there's a great philosopher, uh, Julia Driver, who was uh, who has written uh, quite a lot about this consequentialist approach to virtue, hmm. but. Uh, not many people have read my uh, my PhD thesis, though, so uh, um, maybe it's, uh, you know they haven't had the chance to be convinced. Yeah. They haven't been convinced yet. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'd always been planning to um, to actually release it as a book, and in fact, I, I wrote it that way rather than writing it in the the somewhat more dry style. It's still in the style of an academic book. Not you know don't don't get too excited, uh, but I. Yeah, I actually have, have put this up on my website. Uh, so if people <laughs> want to know a whole lot more about this or they've got some devastating counterexample that they they think I might not have thought of, uh, then feel free to uh, you know download it, have a read, um, and you can find out as much as you want about this, uh, this stuff. Yeah. So I, I think it might be pretty intuitive that one way that you would assess uh, you know, principles of behavior or character traits is by asking the question, if we had more of this character trait, uh, or if we followed this kind of rule, would that be conducive to a world that has lots of well-being and flourishing in it? But I guess, you know, people within deontology or virtue ethics who have encountered this idea and uh, don't think that it captures everything that, that, that they're doing, um, what's, what, what's the reason for that? Yeah, I, I think that it's because they think that, um, that there's something else other than good consequences, um, whether that be happiness or, or a richer conception of good consequences uh, that is that is the thing that grounds out like the, the ideal set of rules to follow. For example, Kantianism says that you should act only on a maxim that you can rationally will should be universalized. Um, so that means basically act only according to the principles uh, which you'd be happy if everyone would act under those principles. And the idea or the hope of it was that there was almost a certain kind of like logical thing that there that and you know there's a famous example that if you were to lie every time you thought you could get away with it then this would kind of undermine communication um so that that would be in some sense uh, self-defeating to do this not just that it would lead to bad outcomes but that even the whole concept of truth telling uh would be kind of incoherent and i think that some examples like promise keeping and lying that there's a story like that, that that makes some sense other examples i think it makes a lot less sense so uh <laughs> a classic example is uh, there's there is a maxim um you know always be the first to offer to help and and uh be the last to complain um, but Kantians would uh, would not be able to act under that maxim uh, because you can't rationally will that everyone be the first to offer to help and that everyone be the last to complain. Mm. Uh, so, and yet, does it feel like it's immoral <laughs> uh, if you were to act under that maxim? Uh, so there, there are kind of interesting cases like this, but that, that's an example of how they're thinking about it in quite a different way. The philosopher Derek Parfit, uh, who is my supervisor for, for this uh, PhD thesis, He's written, you know, uh, on on these areas, and he had this this uh, analogy where he thought maybe the the Kantian and the consequentialist were climbing the same mountain, uh, but from different sides, and that when you perfect them and you have the best version of consequentialism and the best uh, version of Kantianism, you find that they're actually the same kind of theory. And uh, you know, I'm trying to say something that's that's somewhat similar to that. Yeah. 
you know, I think that that's hopeful, and I'm ho also hoping that it's somewhat conciliatory. Uh, I'm not trying to kind of rule the world of moral theories all under the, you know, the stranglehold of consequentialism or something when, when I'm thinking about this. Instead, I just actually think it's a, it's a compelling and conciliatory idea. But it wouldn't be unreasonable if, if people with these theories thought, you know what? Maybe he even comes up with the same virtues as, as I think are the virtues, but it's for the wrong reason, and that matters. Uh, so they're welcome <laughs> to, to, to that view, and uh, you know, I would actually have to debate them on it. Yeah. So, yeah, what was it about uh, the collapse of FTX and the actions that Sam bankman fried took that, that made you c come back to this issue of global consequentialism? Yeah, so I was, you know, I, I started to become, you know, in trying to make sense of it, uh, to think that Maybe Sam, while clearly being an intelligent person and someone who, you know, would seem to have taken utilitarianism very seriously, um, and yet, uh, like, he started doing these things where, as far as we can understand, committing crimes and, and effectively stealing a whole lot of money from I don't know how many thousands of individuals. Crazy stuff. And I started to think, you know what? It's maybe he's a naive utilitarian and, uh, never really got the memo on uh, the, the actually really that's not the way to do it um, and people who, who who are opponents of utilitarianism often critique what I think of as a straw man you know that they say oh utilitarianism is a terrible theory and then they go and describe naive utilitarianism and the the philosophers who talk about utilitarianism you know say that's not actually our theory uh, and, and as we've never endorsed that have a look you know if we're quite careful about this in fact we've explicitly said we don't endorse that and yet it seems like uh, perhaps because he wasn't a philosopher sam may have just really been in the grip of this naive version and that that he was aware that that there were these calls such as my own you know thesis or, or things i'm not sure if he's actually read it but but he was aware that there were things like this uh that suggest a kind of tempering of like this um approach of just just try to calculate everything out and i think he he might have thought that's just kind of sounds like good pr um that's what you tell people but actually then you just go back and uh, and kind of machiavellianly calculate things and act in this extremely uncooperative way with other moral players in the you know in morality uh, and also in an uncooperative way with all of the, you know, the people whose lives he was affecting. Mm. And uh, so that that's, you know, may, maybe, it, again, maybe this is a kind of galaxy brain approach and that, that it's, it's better to understand it's just the kind of, you know, pride and shame and or greed or, you know, just various other emotions that are not particularly connected to to ethics. Uh, but I do worry that that he might have been thinking this and that uh, that this could be a fairly widespread, you kind of a mistaken understanding of utilitarianism uh, within uh, th this movement and perhaps beyond that. Yeah, I guess, yeah, we, we don't know exactly whether it, th this was a, a, one of the mistakes that, that was made here, but it certainly does seem like a trap that someone could fall into, uh, especially if they conceive of themselves as being particularly hardcore and not wanting to make any compromises uh, yeah. <laughs> in order to, to, be, to be nice and cooperative and, and follow common sense with other people. Yeah, and I don't think that being hardcore and not making compromises are virtues uh, on either on uh, utilitarian grounds, uh, I don't think they lead to the, the most good systematically, or on any other grounds. Um, but they are, you know, there's sometimes there's a culture where people, you know, uh, try to value these types of things. And I, I think it, that's a, a mistake to try to compete on on those. Yeah. I guess to, to be clear, the, the mistake that we're worried was made is leaning too hard into, try, into, you know, with each decision that you're making, thinking, will this produce good consequences and just trying to analyze it out based on the effects that you think it will have, rather than saying, you know, if I adopt that approach, there's a lot of traps that I could fall into in terms of self-serving bias. And the, there's just massive, you know, I could just massively get it wrong. I could just estimate, estimate the, the consequence of the actions extremely inaccurately. And so in practice, I guess, especially when, you know, once I have to make a lot of decisions and I have to do them quite quickly, and these are often quite consequential decisions, instead, I'm going to need a different decision procedure because a different decision procedure that thinks less about, uh, that, that analyzes less the immediate uh, consequences that I, that I think we'll have is going to, in fact, have better consequences. So I should be more rule abiding and try to cultivate characteristics in, in my decision making and my behavior that will result in, on average, in, in me having more positive effects on the world, like having integrity, uh, like having prudence <laughs> and thinking about and, and not being willing to you know, overrule other people's autonomy and things like that. Exactly. Ultimately, effective altruism 
isn't the same thing as utilitarianism or consequentialism. Uh, and, you know, as I said earlier, you know, the, in some ways, the whole point of creating this new thing was to take these, this, this element that, uh, that the utilitarian saw clearly, but then to build something around that element, which we could all actually agree with. Uh, but there's still a, a bunch that we can learn from the utilitarian and consequentialist moral philosophers because there have been a, a tradition of thinking seriously about doing good. Now, they, you know, if you were to follow that theory, you might mistakenly only be thinking about doing good and not be thinking enough about constraints uh, on your actions and other things. But at the very least, they had been taking doing good seriously and uh, and had been uh, thinking very carefully about some of these kinds of traps that you could fall into. Um, and so that's why I think it's an exciting opportunity to to learn some lessons uh, from from these areas of philosophy. Okay, pushing on to the third insight here. Um, Another lesson that I really liked was having a way of conceptualizing um, what sort of impact personal character and integrity have on your impact, which is something you know I, I thought it was important, but I didn't have any kind of mental framework for thinking about uh, how that could how that could be quite important. So, what, what what's the naive reason why someone might not think that character and virtue are so uh, important by the lights of utilitarianism or effective altruism? I suppose. Yeah, and, and so they're good uh, because. I think that there is a naive reason here, and there's actually some truth to it. So the reason that uh, effective altruism focuses so much on uh, on impact and, and um, are doing good, uh, for example, through donation, is that we're aware that there's this extremely wide uh, variation in different ways of doing good, um, whether that be perhaps the good that's done by different careers or how much good is done by donating $1,000 to different charities. And it's not as clear that one can get these kinds of improvements in terms of character. So if you imagine someone who, say, at, you know, is there an undergraduate, they're just finishing their degree, about to go off and start a, a career. And, you know, if you do get them to give 10 times more than the average person and to give it 10 times more effectively, you know, they may be able to do 100 times as much good with their giving. And that may be more value than they, they produce in all other aspects of their life. But if you told them to be to be a really good character in their life, and that was the only advice, and you didn't change their career or anything else, it's not clear that you could get them to produce outcomes like that. It's not clear what having 100 times as much virtue looks like. <laughs> no, <laughs> exactly, well, yeah. probably couldn't have 100 times as much virtue. And, or, you know, maybe, maybe you can have a bit more virtue, and then there's a question about how much goodness does the virtue create or something. But it doesn't seem like it comes from the same kind of distribution. Um, I'm, you know, it's unlikely that there's a there's a version of me out there with some table calculating log normal distributions of virtue or something like that. And I think that that's right. But here's how I think about it, is that ultimately, in terms of the impact we end up having in the world, you could think of virtue as being a multiplier, not by, you know, some number between 1 and 10,000 or something with this huge variation, but maybe as a number between minus 1 and, and plus 1 or, or something like that, or, or maybe most of the, the values in that range. Um, but, but maybe if you're really, really virtuous, you know, you're a 3 or something. But the fact that there is this negative bit is really relevant, um, and that if someone is, uh, it's very much possible to actually just produce bad outcomes. Um, clearly, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried uh, seems to be an example of this. And then, if you've scaled up your impact, then you could end up with massive negative effects uh, through having a bad character. Mm. Uh, maybe by taking too many risks, maybe by um, by trampling over people on your way to trying to achieve those good outcomes, and or, or various other aspects. Yeah, yeah. So, so the point here is that even though virtue in practice doesn't seem to vary in these enormous ways, uh, in the same way that say the cost effectiveness of different health treatments might, or you know some problems being far more important or neglected th th than others. You end up like all of the other stuff that you do ends up kind of getting multiplied. <laughs> this number between minus one and one, which which represents the kind of character that you have, and therefore the sort of effects that you have on the project that you're a part of and and the people around you. And maybe we'll say, uh, you know, a typical level of virtue might be point three out of one or point point four out of one. But some meaningful fraction of people have a <laughs> have a kind of character and integrity that's below zero, which means that just 
usually when those people get involved in a project, they're actually causing harm, uh, even though people might not appreciate it, because they're just inclined to act like jerks, say, or they lie too much. Or, you know, when, when push comes to shove, they're just going to do something disgraceful that basically sets back their entire enterprise. And there might be might be various other mechanisms as, as, as well. And then, obviously, it's very clear that uh, going from my, <laughs> minus uh, point two to two is extremely important because it determines whether you have a positive or negative impact at all. Yeah. Uh, And like another way to see some of that is that when you're scaling up on the kind of raw impact, uh, and for example, suppose you've noticed that when founders uh, set up their their companies and, you know, some of these companies end up making a million dollars for the founders, some make a billion dollars, a thousand times as much. You know, this is one of these uh, heavy tailed distributions. And then if you've got a person with bad character it, the, the amount of damage they could do with a billion dollar company is, uh, you know, is like a thousand times higher as well as the, the, the amount of good they could do with it is a thousand times higher. So it's especially important if someone is going to go and, and try to just do generically high impact things uh, that they have a, a, a positive sign on, on that, that overall equation uh, and not a negative one. And, and another way to look at that is that when you have something like, um, like earning to give, because there's an intermediate step where it turns into dollars, and dollars are kind of morally neutral, depending depends on what you do with them, or at least morally ambiguous, uh, as opposed to it directly uh, helping people, then there's there's more there's more need uh, to kind of vet those people for having a good character, and before uh, you know joining their project or something like that. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, in your talk at Effective Altruism Global, you said that. Your impression is that people you meet who are uh, passionate about effective altruism are often, for example, really generous and empathetic. They have uh, th- th- those virtues uh, maybe quite a bit more than, than average in society. But uh, you'd notice that sometimes people seem to lack the virtue of, of earnestness. I didn't get what you were talking about there. Or it didn't, didn't totally resonate with me. And I think that might just be because I don't meet that many people anymore. So I, don't, I extremely don't have my, my finger on the, on, on the pulse. So first off, why would you class uh, earnestness as, as a virtue? Yeah, I, I guess uh, what I'm thinking here is that yeah, you're right that it's not normally uh, it's not normally considered a virtue. I think it, you know it doesn't sound totally unreasonable, uh, and I would be open to revisionary virtues. Hmm. But when it comes to doing good in the world and and say working well with other people, it can be very useful to just be transparent about your motivations, um, and for it to just be clear to people that you're just you know, you just want to be a good person <laughs> uh, and uh, to kind of dispense with the sarcasm and the kind of, you know, arch comments and so on, or, or with the kind of, you know, oily or slimy presentation in an attempt to be slick about things and because you think it's being more professional or to dispense with um, having a poker face so no one can tell what you're really thinking and so on. Now, if you want to be a good business person, you might need to actually go in those directions a bit. But actually, one of the nice things about you know, being part of a community of just trying to help people in the world is that you don't really have to, um, to build up the poker face. You know, maybe there's some rarer situation where by bluffing a bit more, you can create a better outcome. You know, maybe you can convince a kind of big company to back down on their, their factory farming techniques, uh, because they think you had a stronger hand than you really did. And so I think we tend to think that, well, because the, those things might come up, it would be really good if like I was able to, you know, have a poker face or to lie if I needed to or, or things like that. Whereas if you're actually the kind of person who can't lie if you needed to, um, and people can tell that. And you're just transparent, and people can see that you're just doing this stuff <laughs> because you've you've got this um, maybe even slightly gauche level of oh, I just want to help people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like uh, as opposed to oh the world is like you know people are so uh, so terrible and <laughs> yeah and so I think that that this kind of earnestness is actually a, a benefit for cooperating and for. Um, you know, having people be less suspicious uh, and and less kind of thinking, oh, there must be some other motivation. Why would there be a group of people like based around helping people? That's that's crazy. Uh, they must be out for something. Um, perhaps leading to the, these types of things we were talking about earlier, uh, where uh, where someone says, you know, why would these CEOs say this? You know, they, they must have an ulterior motive or something. There's, you know, it's a common a common line of, of thinking when someone says something. Mm. Uh, whereas if if you are just actually pretty transparent and you are just have you have goals which turns out most people share or at least are not against, then there's more chance they'll just let you get on with actually doing that good work. 
Yeah, yeah. I've had a related rant that I think, think I've said on the show before, but maybe maybe not recently, which is just that some people get interested in persuasion techniques where they start uh, you know, reading guides to how you can present arguments extremely compellingly and maybe be extremely charismatic so that people are more likely to believe the things that you're saying. And just it, my observation is that this stuff is not very useful. And basically, you should just say what you think and then give the explanation as, clear, as clearly as you reasonably can for why it is that you believe that. And that try, trying very actively to be persuasive specifically rather than to be clear, say, mm-hmm. uh, just ends up turning people off in the long run because you come across as someone who's trying to be persuasive and then people don't like that. I, I don't like it. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in that case, um, maybe clarity and directness work well if you've got a good point to make okay, right. um, and, and they systematically work better the better your point is. Uh, whereas if you were someone who had a bad point, uh, but it was a point that was very much in the interest of your company, uh, maybe they would do better by learning all these persuasion techniques because the other technique doesn't work for them. Uh, so I guess what I'm kind of suggesting is people who are trying to argue something that's actually true and people who are trying to promote something that is actually good. They, they should play to their strength. Yeah, yeah, they should. Yeah, exactly. Uh, play to their strengths and, um, you know, enjoy being in the situation where you don't have to be cagey about your motivations and so on. And it also, you know, one can get more value from this earnestness in situations like face-to-face conversations where we have, you know, very good ability to to notice tells in the other person's behavior and so on, such that you end up being more transparent mm. uh, and it's harder to to lie and uh, and bluff, as opposed to, say, on Twitter, where you just, you offer your, you know, 280 characters and then <laughs> there's like hardly any bandwidth and the other person thinks, well, you know, well, you would say that, wouldn't you? Because they have no idea who you are or anything else about you. So it is a bit harder to do this kind of thing uh, in those low bandwidth communications. Uh, but but I think that people in effective altruism and, and other areas of, of trying to do good in the world, you know, should actually, yeah, be, be more earnest and just try to be a community of people who... Yeah, tr- trying to be good people and trying to do good at the same time. Yeah. Are there any other virtues or maybe revisionist virtues uh, that you think uh, listeners uh, might underrate uh, and perhaps should cultivate more? Yeah, I, I think that that one that some people have, have rated in this community, Paul Cristiano has spoken up in favor of it, uh, for example, but I think is still underrated, uh, is integrity. And this is about consistently living up to your values. Uh, So acting in a principled way uh, in private, even when no one else is there to see. And so you could think of it as like the the action version of honesty, where honesty uh, allows people to trust your words uh, because you've got, if you've built up a disposition uh, of... uh, you know, of not lying. Hmm. Uh, and integrity is about letting people trust your actions. Uh, so they know that even if you had the opportunity to defraud them or something like that, that you're just not the kind of person who would, uh, or to betray them in some other way or something like that. Uh, and so I think that, again, it, it is, it's kind of a bit like with uh, earnestness, it involves having a kind of transparency about your values as well. So that being the kind of person who basically couldn't betray people. Um, and I think a lot of us start off like that. Um, maybe maybe we should avoid playing games, uh, like bluffing games, uh, like <laughs> poker or, or uh, werewolf or things like this, uh, <laughs> to avoid uh, training up the ability to, to lie or deceive or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but ultimately... Uh, yeah, I, I think that, uh, that integrity uh, is, is a virtue I'd like to see more of as well. Yeah, uh, we'll stick up a link to that Paul Cristiano post on integrity. I realized I've, I've used that term integrity a bunch of times through the conversation. And I read this post by Cristiano many years ago, probably uh, nine or nine or 10 years ago. And it's just become so embedded in my mind that this is the operationalization of what integrity is, that I'd almost even forgotten <laughs> that, that Paul Cristiano had written this, this attempt to explain what, 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 what integrity is trying to capture. So uh, it's, it's, I think it's, a, if I recall, it's on the technical side, but, it, but it's definitely one worth, worth looking up if you're interested. In prepping for this interview, I listened back to a fireside chat that you did with Will McCaskill back in early 2022, and the question of character came up then as, as well. And both of you expressed concerns that an effective altruism community where there was a lot of money available might be a lighthouse and might start attracting people who had some bad character traits. And one of those that you mentioned specifically was kind of a masculine recklessness and a, and a bias towards taking action. And to me, that's actually a big worry that I have about the world these days because I noticed that systematically people who are inclined to take big gambles end up making more money uh, and advancing their career and getting into positions of power in society. 
And you then have people who are kind of naturally maybe overconfident, overconfident gamblers by personality, who are then satisfied with their personal brilliance because they've had a string of perhaps you know, partly skill, but also partly lucky successes. And those people end up making very important decisions that have effects on on, on many other other people. I think arguably this phenomenon played out with with Sam Bankman-Fried, but I think it's actually a near universal issue across business, uh, you know, government, uh, politics, the the, the media. And you should expect to see it in all spheres of life where you typically need to take risks in order to reach the top of a hierarchy. Yeah, does, does this resonate with you? Yeah, uh, no. Th- this is <laughs> this is definitely a uh, a big problem with the world, uh, and in fact, it, you know, it is part of our our reason why we have certain kind of stereotypes or, or beliefs about politicians and uh, and business people and so on because they, they've been selected uh, for a bunch of these uh, traits which are uh, which are problematic, and I think that as well as that, having more humility about these things uh, and an awareness that that you may have got lucky a bunch of times uh, is is uh, very helpful. And, uh, you know, to the extent to which you've had success, having humility about what got you there and, and whether it was your awesome judgment in all cases, including future cases, or whether it, it's, uh, uh, it may have been good fortune, uh, you yeah. know, we, we, could all, uh, we could all learn from that. Yeah, I think this is a case of if you promote people who have achieved success, this is a case of the winner's curse where you end up both selecting people who are skilled and selecting people who are lucky. And I guess at the very top of a hierarchy, you should expect people who have had an awful lot of luck in their life. Uh, they made some big gambles in there and they happen to, to just pay off. I guess appreciating that this is an almost inevitable consequence of promoting people based on perceived performance and ex post performance rather than you know whether they made good judgments um, ex, ex ante before we know the outcome. It makes me think that you almost want to have some people at the top of businesses, at the top of organizations that, that operate like this, that are selected because they're the kinds of people who never would get promoted there because then they're, they're cautious people by nature rather than, than gamblers who play double or nothing, nothing with their career. And so they should be in the room, the decision-making room, before really important um, decisions are made, I guess, especially ones with downside. You know, none of this matters that much if you're just running a restaurant chain and the worst thing that could happen is that the restaurant chain goes bust and and a different restaurant moves into the same building. But when we're talking about stuff that where the outcomes go well below zero, then <laughs> I think we need to offset this this phenomenon. Yeah. If there were ways of assessing, you know, it, ultimately the, the what they achieved, you could think of it as a combination of a systematic effect and then some random variation. Mm. So yeah, maybe the, the individuals uh, have a certain level of systematic effect. So like the mean of their, their distribution of outcomes. And then there's also this variance. Uh, and if you have a higher variance, that can help a lot if all that's being selected for are the most you know, the, the one in a billion cases or something like that, or even the one in a million cases, if you're just looking at those, then getting, um, getting say, one in 10,000 level lucky may be the easier way to, to get into that bracket than being one in a million level brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and so if there's a way of, of assessing the variance that they took and then effectively penalizing them for it, you know, just trying to subtract that off, uh, then that could be a way of doing it. I think that when it comes to stock trading companies, they have ways of doing this with their their staff where they've got various metrics to try to make sure that the staff didn't um didn't make their money through just getting lucky um i don't know exactly how that works uh it might be that it's that the methods they've got are just very tailored to those areas and couldn't be learned from uh, but it might also be that that they're people who've who've just had to really squarely look this in the eye uh, and that they've they've found some things that they could teach the rest of us yeah it, it's interesting that it, I think government bureaucracies are almost the reverse of this. Or, or typically, people think that government bureaucrats are often extremely risk averse rather than very risk taking. Um, you know, even even at upper levels, it doesn't seem like they're selecting for particularly reckless people. This is a total aside, but I, I love this podcast that I listened to a couple of weeks ago uh, on the Ezra Klein show, which is called uh, "The Book I Wish Every Policymaker Would Read." It was an interview with someone called uh, Jennifer Palka. But uh, she describes how, at least in the bureaucracies that she's familiar with in the US, they don't promote people based on outcomes or performance. They promote people based on whether they followed the rules.
rules, whether they followed the specified decision procedures. And it's interesting that 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 produces a totally different failure mode in the kinds of people who they're selecting, people who that they literally filter out people who care about whether what they're doing is sensible because those people can't stand it and and they leave and select people who are happy to follow the rules, uh, even if it leads to disaster. But yeah, I'll, I'll just leave that there. I suppose, you know, we could try to move away from this approach, but I'm sure there are other kinds of failures one could encounter. Okay, to wrap up this section, you helped inspire what has ultimately become effective altruism. Well, and I guess effective altruism, you know, it's both a question, how could one do the most good or how could one do most of the good <laughs> that, that one could. It's a stream of thought intellectually in philosophy and economics and other fields. And it's also a group of people who care about these issues and, and try to act on them. Of course, it's grown a very long way since 2008 when really only a handful of people were invested in ineffective altruism construed at least this way, uh, at, at least narrowly construed. Um, and you were in a position then to, to shape it in a, in a really big way. I guess now it's big enough that no individual person really has that much control over it. Um, and what goes on is the result of organic decision making that happens in a really decentralized way between thousands, possibly tens of thousands of people who decide what they're going to do. I imagine it's a little bit like uh, you have a child, an actual child, and I imagine that to some extent this is a little bit like uh, having a child that goes on to grow up and become a teenager and an adult who the parents can't and probably shouldn't try, try to control. They just have to watch it leave home and hope that they've done a sufficiently good job of setting it on the, on the right path that things are going to go well. But of course... Like all people, uh, that they're going to have their own strengths and weaknesses and sometimes do things that their parents really love, but sometimes do <laughs> make big mistakes that their parents disapprove of. I'm kind of curious to hear how you overall feel about this child that, uh, that you, among other people, kind of helped to bring into this world. Yeah, well, uh, that would have been a fantastic question for you to have asked uh, if you had me on the show a year ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd be <laughs> like, well, well, it's, uh, yeah. it's uh, going a bit crazy at the moment, but, uh, but you know, probably... Probably yeah. good still on balance. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, yeah. So yeah, I, I've been very mixed feelings, uh, with regards to, uh, the, this FTX, uh, catastrophe. Uh, although by, by numbers of EAs, it's quite possible that it's just actually one who is causing that. We, we don't, you know, again, we don't fully know how many people knew what was happening, mm. uh, or what responsibility they had, but. Uh, one thing that you know that we try to take seriously in EA is that sometimes there are power law distributions and things where you know we we all take good shots at something and you know one in a thousand of us get lucky and have a really big impact and we should take that seriously and, and uh, uh, so we've got to take the downs as well as the ups on that mm. and if it is the case that you know that w we occasionally produce someone uh, like Sam and if we can't avoid I mean we should certainly be trying to avoid <laughs> th these kinds of damages again. But, you know, they're then, you know, quite mixed feelings, really. And overall, you know, I, I've done some attempting to uh, to look at everything, and I think that effective altruism uh, still seems to be very positive overall and extremely positive if you go person by person and try to say, is that a good person who's trying to do good with their life and so on? Yeah. Um, but I'm unhappy to even be in the position where I've got mixed feelings, like even if, you know, overall it's it's good, right? A bit like if you had a child who, you know, did some seriously wrong stuff, uh, but overall the stuff in their life was good, you'd still be like, I, I don't, I, you know, I'd love to just give you a, just a, they're totally great, you know, end of conversation. And instead I, you have to get into this stuff. Yeah. What would make you happy to see more of in the, in, in the next decade? Yeah. I, well, I think, I guess if we can avoid those problems um, and these downsides and just become more of a kind of, a community of people that that others are just happy to have in the world, you know, that they might not be willing to join and, and do the, these works, but a community that uh, has a, a pretty sterling reputation and because it's well-earned, not, not because they're doing bad things and no one knows. And while also keeping track of actually trying to have good outcomes in the world. Um, I think that, that too many movements get too hung up with reputational things or with, with not trying to do anything that could look bad from any perspective and don't do enough good. Uh, so I think that this is a somewhat challenging thing to, to navigate, uh, but it seems to me that, that we know at the moment which way to steer the ship, uh, and that's a bit more towards trying to actually stamp out uh, some, some bad actions by people in the community. Okay, let's push on and talk about artificial intelligence. As you were saying uh, at the beginning of the interview, AI has kind of gone a little bit crazy this year, and we've had quite a lot of episodes focused on it, on it recently. You, you wrote about risks from AI in your book, 
the precipice where um, you put a one in 10 chance on humanity going extinct to advances in artificial intelligence. How have your views shifted in the in the three or four years since you since you wrote the book? Yeah, well, I guess one thing I can just say uh, first is uh, it's not necessarily one in 10 chance that we go extinct due to advanced AI. Okay. I, it was a one in 10 chance of existential catastrophe due to AI. And I think it might have been Paul Cristiano where I kind of saw this laid out best. But it's not clear in the real AI catastrophe scenarios whether everyone will die. Um, in particular, if you were a super intelligent AI that, whose values were not aligned with humans, it could still be that humans are the most interesting thing to learn from on the planet and that you would want to have some of them around in the future. Or maybe that you'd need them to, to service your server farms or something like that. Uh, but those would still be scenarios in which humanity's potential is destroyed and that we exist merely as you know slaves or servants uh, to the, these AI systems that don't value us in and of ourselves and would protect themselves from any attempts we would make to uh, to destroy them. So, so that's to say... The, the whole point of the idea of existential catastrophe is that there's not much need to distinguish those two scenarios. They're both like, we lose like 99% or more of the, the value that we could have had. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a perfect case uh, for, for using the term. And That's um, not a very reassuring clarification, but sorry, carry it's, on. It's, yeah, no, it's, it's not a reassuring <laughs> clarification at all. In fact, there was a recent statement, uh, you know, uh, signed by, by a lot of prominent people uh, in AI and, and beyond, uh, saying that uh, that AI could pose a uh, you know serious threat of human extinction, mm. and that it should be a global priority. Uh, and I did have some quibbles about this with the <laughs> to use of the term extinction, but decided that it, it was they were pointless quibbles from from most people's perspective um, for that reason. But yeah, so how have my views shifted? Well, ultimately, AI capabilities have been continuing along very strongly, pretty much in line with what I expected in terms of capabilities. I thought that the the trends could stall out, though. So maybe it would go off trend, you know, and and hit a wall. And yet it had a few years in which to hit the wall and it, it hasn't happened. Uh, so that's one thing. Mm. There's been a bit of a shift in terms of what those capabilities are, uh, especially towards large language models. Um, so AI systems that are very good at um, responding to text with more text. And that actually is, I think, pretty good. I'm happy about that. The, the most troubling scenarios are scenarios that involve AI agents where they're actively trying to maximize something, you know, as we said, uh, with maximization is perilous. And a lot of the, the stories that I think that, that move me the most about why I'm afraid of uh, some of the bad outcomes that could be produced are to do with kind of ruthless, extremely intelligent agents that are maximizing something, um, which doesn't capture everything that matters. Um, and so to the extent to which instead we have systems that are not agents, that's good. Powerful systems that could actually produce useful stuff in the world without being agents. And then also there are systems which can actually imbibe vast amounts of information. Um, so Stuart Russell uh, has pointed out that almost every novel that's ever been written uh, is almost entirely filled with examples of humans judging other humans based on their behavior. Mm. Uh, and so there's a, a huge amount of extremely rich training data for the AI systems. And we call it training data, but it's something in order for the AI to know what it is that actually does matter, to know what this morality thing is all about. It, it has to have some way of connecting with it and gaining information about it. And so the fact that that it could do so through our writing is a lot more promising than if you have to do it through creating some kind of you know virtual reality environment where it has to learn about morality or something like that uh, for itself. Uh, so, so those aspects are a kind of promising shift in the technology, but it has got very general uh, very quickly. Um, text is an extremely general mechanism. And so, whereas it seemed like uh, a few years back uh, when I was writing the book, that, say, Alpha Zero, uh, DeepMind's system that can learn a bunch of different board games, you know, including Go and chess, um, you know, that involve different kinds of pieces in a perfect information game uh, with no randomness, I think, uh, and it can learn them from scratch. That was very general in the world of classical board games, <laughs> but it doesn't even include modern board games, mm. uh, and it doesn't include a bunch of other things. Uh, whereas systems uh, like GPT-4 can do like a, a vast amount of different kinds of things because text is just such a general way of, uh, of uh, interacting. Uh, so that's kind of capabilities. Advances in AI alignment, so, so trying to work out ways of making systems safe, 
I think have gone worse than I expected. I, I thought there was more chance of, of some significant progress, and uh, and yet it's been pretty incremental progress. And then another one is, uh, let's say, governance or policy kind of progress, and that's actually something where where I've been pretty excited recently. <laughs> Up until uh, very recently, it was uh, you know impossible for uh, world leaders to talk, you know, to, to to be saying things like that they're they're worried about a risk of human extinction or other kinds of existential catastrophe from AI, even if they thought it, and difficult to to communicate these things to government, uh, you know, when, when they get you in to, to advise them. Whereas now a lot of people have come out of the closet on that one, um, you know, and, uh, you know, as, as I said, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of a current and a former Secretary General of the UN among, you know, various heads of, former heads of state and, and so forth, uh, saying that they think this is a serious risk. Uh, so big changes there. And then that might make many more ways of governing this or, or policy options uh, more realistic. Um, one of the, the classic examples was this idea that if we go too slowly, someone else who's, who's less prudent or careful will just keep going quickly and we'll end up having an AI system that's as dangerous as the one they would make uh, get there first. Uh, but now there's actually a, a bit of a more realistic possibility of going slow together. In which case, uh, if the different nations or, or, or groupings which are capable of producing um, some super intelligent system, if if the main players uh, would all be able to agree to to go slower and to also um, have some way of verifying that the others are and being slower and careful too, then it, it just feels like that this is uh, perhaps a realistic possibility now. Yeah, are there any? Views you have about AI risk that you imagine uh, maybe not not familiar to listeners, or at least not not widely shared. I'm I'm not sure. Um, probably a lot of people already have this this concern. In the precipice, I think I wasn't clear enough uh, that uh, you know I do think that there is substantial risk of misuse of AI systems, leading to possible existential risk from that. Um, I was generally thinking of that under my category of dystopian outcomes, rather than in the in the section about that I wrote about AI. Uh, but it's actually quite difficult to have permanent dystopian futures unless there's advanced technology such as through AI in order to do that. Uh, for example, for a dictator to have permanent control, um, whereas AI surveillance could could really ramp up their ability to control a population. Yeah. So I'm definitely concerned of <laughs> by both uh, risks of misuse and risks uh, from uh, arising from creating an artificially intelligent adversary you know, accidentally. Uh, I think that these are uh, both serious areas. Yeah. I know you have a daughter who I think is about is about eight or so now. How do events in the last year make you feel about her future? Do, do, do you think being a father changes how you grapple with with current events emotionally? Yeah, it does. Um, it, it does make it more difficult to deal with. Um, I, I think that this may be the, the upside of that is that uh, sometimes when dealing with with these risks, one doesn't always, I don't know, take it fully seriously or have it kind of hit you like it should. Now, if the if the risks of, of human extinction are hitting you like they should all the time, you're probably just not going to be able to, to function. Uh, but it's useful to be hit with the, you know, to, to be sobered up every now and then, you know, and uh, to, to really realize the, the gravity of these things we're talking about. And, you know, I, I can assure you that if you have a child, uh, then uh, every time you, you kind of connect the, those two boxes of your life, uh, work on existential risk and, uh, and being a parent, then the gravity does hit you. And one could certainly, as a parent, feel guilty about, you know, spending extra time at the office or something. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do. But then, uh, you know, I'm also striving to protect her, uh, you know, um, among myself and my wife and everyone I, I know and and, uh, and everyone I don't know and all those people to come. Uh, so it, it, it does kind of add to, to my motivation and, um, yeah, it kind of keeps one grounded on, on just what's at stake. I know that the UK government recently appointed a new a chair of the UK's AI Foundation Model Task Force, which <laughs> I don't know, sounds, sounds a little bit technical, but I think uh, this is a, quite a senior advisor to, to the government on, on these sorts of issues. I think they appointed Ian Hogarth to that role. And I know that 
Ian is really very troubled by risks from misaligned AI, among among other ways that things could, could go wrong. I also saw on Twitter Rishi Sunak announcing that they'd committed a hundred million pounds towards AI safety research. I'm not I'm not sure whether there's been a similar commitment by any other government to fund technical work to to try to address these issues before. Um, so I guess that was pretty heartening to see. Yeah, I haven't read very much about either of these stories yet, though. Are, are, you, are you up to date on on what's been going on? I've been, uh, yeah, been somewhat following it, uh, but I think it's still difficult to know what's actually happening there. Mm. Uh, I I believe that they just recently committed a hundred million pounds uh, towards a somewhat more nationalistic AI project of creating a, a UK government um, foundation model. So, uh, not having them all be in the hands of companies, but rather in the hands of a democratically elected uh, government. Mm. And then uh, I don't know whether whether they've tried to kind of steer the ship on that one and, and realize that actually duplicating the, the current levels of foundation models is maybe not the best way to be spending that money. Um, I certainly had wished uh, that they would instead spend it, you know, thinking, well, how much could they buy in terms of like high quality advice on how to navigate policy issues here? Uh, and it sounds like that the, they are trying to steer it a bit in that direction. Uh, but I, I wouldn't be shocked if this uh, this commitment is not quite as good as it seems on its face, uh, because it turns out that uh, that that was a bit of a spin on it. And um, we will see. There have been a, a lot of policy ideas related to AI being discussed in the in the media and by by policy makers uh, recently. Have any of them kind of struck you as particularly interesting and maybe maybe worth highlighting? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, in a, in a general sense, uh, while I expressed a little bit of skepticism about this exact hundred million pound figure, um, and I would love to be proven wrong, Rishi Sunak also announced having a, a summit, a kind of international summit on AI safety, with the the plan being to, you know, to invite delegations from from major countries um, as well as people from the the technical communities in order to try to make some progress on uh, how could we make these systems safer and and govern them and, and what kind of restrictions could we could we reasonably impose that, that people could could deal with um so which is extremely exciting yes yeah, so, so I, I i thought that that sounds like exactly the right way to be dealing with this which is to move very quickly to a stage of information gathering and trying to get people to think seriously and saying look this is the time to to have your input about what the policies will be but as opposed to just kind of announcing some policies uh, just off the cuff, uh, which which probably would be mistaken. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, there, there've also been various calls, uh, such as from the elders, uh, to uh, try to establish international bodies uh, to deal with this. The the elders suggested that this be modelled on uh, the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, and. I think that, that that could well be kind of right, I, like at least an interesting kind of model for it. Uh, obviously, it's not exactly the same situation. There are a number of, of quite important differences between between the technologies surrounding uh, nuclear weapons and AI. But I think that if it's a pretty good starting point for, for thinking about how one could uh, do that. Yeah, in terms of information gathering, I, I know some people have been very concerned that it seems like at least some people in government are, seem to really be taking their lead from the main AI labs, which are kind of all private companies that have a significant kind of profit motivation. And they, they think that, well, I suppose there's a difficult trade-off here because those labs have technical information that other folks don't have. And they also are the, one of the main groups that might have to implement any suggestion, any, any policies that are, that are suggested. On the other hand, the motivations of those labs is not necessarily the same as the interests of society as a whole. And they also come from quite a particular perspective where these are folks who have decided to work on AI, where many other people might have decided not to because they thought it was too risky. So there's kind of a selection effect there. And, and there's people who have wisdom across like so many other areas who need to be consulted as, as well. Yeah, do you have any, any, any take on this, on this controversy? Yeah, I think that uh, if one's talking about regulating an, um, an area of industry, uh, then some people from that area of industry should be involved in the discussions. Yeah. So otherwise, I mean, it's terrible to just <laughs> regulate without any uh, ability for people to push back in case you've made an error in, in what you're suggesting. But that's different from saying that they should be the majority of the people in the room um, or that they should have a substantial amount of the power over the decision. Um, in fact, I think they should have quite little power over the decision and, uh, and be you know, a, uh, a notable minority of, of people in the discussion. Mm. Let, let, let's say maybe 10% of the, of the people in the discussion. That seems about right to me. So that if they've got very good points, which would convince the others, uh, that they can make them. But where they don't have the power to just kind of push to get what they want. 
Yeah. Is there anything that you'd like to see AI labs do differently than they than they are currently? Yeah, I mean, I would like them to uh, to race less. Yeah, uh, that's certainly something that uh, I do find quite concerning. And you know, it was predicted that one could get into this kind of dynamic, and I think we're we're seeing a bit of it, and it's a, it's a real problem. How how racy would you say they are? <laughs> I guess that's a good point. You know, it's it's like how much further could it go? Um, it's a good question. They're moving extremely quickly. Partly the technology is developed very quickly, but partly, um, you know, so with, with say, GPT-4, the, the move to kind of allowing it to then interface with all of these other apps and APIs and so on and, and letting people build agents out of it, which then could reintroduce those risks, has all been happening extremely quickly. And so it's hard to know exactly how much of it is racing, so as in going faster because other people are going faster, as opposed to just going faster because you want you want to get there quickly, <laughs> which is less like racing. It's more just like getting getting your task done efficiently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I suppose it's it's not surprising that some of the companies that are at the at kind of leading in this area have a culture of moving very fast. Because <laughs> if you had a culture of moving slowly, you probably wouldn't be there. Uh, and so that I think. Many of them just like to launch things. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that I think that there is quite a bit of it. I, I should add that it's actually not trivial for them to not race. So you might think what would be good is to have an agreement not to race, right? Um, so like, okay, well, we won't race if you won't. And then that will avoid the, the bad social incentive for them to race. Um, but making such an agreement could be illegal. Um, it could, could breach antitrust law if it's seen that the consumers are losing out um, from them not racing. Yeah. And so it is actually kind of difficult. Um, it, ultimately, there are ways to deal with this. Uh, for example, if there was regulation saying they had to go slower, then they could go slower. And another example is if there was an industry body created, um, which had kind of appropriate membership standards, and then that body said that its members of the body have to go slower. Um, that would also work because the, ultimately industry have seen situations like this before where where um, it can be hard to tell from outside whether people are suggesting that some kind of regulatory thing, self-regulation perhaps standards, whether they're just trying to create an artificial barrier or whether they're really needed. So there are kind of right and wrong ways of doing that, which, or, you know, approved and unapproved ways of doing it. And so it would be important that they do it through these these approved ways. It, it is a little bit alarming that, you know, we might all die because of uh, antitrust law or something, <laughs> making it harder for, for groups to actually, yeah. you know, it, when people talk about market incentives and so on, and these concerns, you know, that, that capitalism can kind of, has these market forces that, that push in, in really problematic directions of just maximizing dollars and letting everything else go to hell. Well, that is the kind of scenario that we're... Con- this is the archetypal extreme case. Yeah, and both, both of the kind of corporate structures that the companies are embedded in could be pushing in those ways, although some of them have some protection against that with unusual um, corporate structures where there's a non-profit that owns them and things like that. Um, but interestingly, even just antitrust law has this approach of give the consumers what they want, damn it, <laughs> and uh, and the consumers don't care about this risk; they care about getting the getting new shiny things quickly. Yeah. Uh, then it could be a kind of government version of this capitalist impulse, which could actually uh, increase risk. Yeah, antitrust law causing human extinction is very out of left field, <laughs> and yet shockingly imaginable. Are there any labs that you? think of performing better or worse than, than others where maybe, you know, they should be perhaps lauded for being a bit more responsible and uh, others perhaps <laughs> uh, should be called out for being a bit uh, more reckless? Yeah, I guess as I see it, um, I think that uh, I've generally been pretty impressed uh, by uh, by DeepMind and Anthropic. I would be happier if they were both moving a bit slower with these things. Um, uh, but OpenAI is, is going, you know, faster than the others. So that that is somewhat concerning in and of itself, um, and not just the raw technology, as I said, but also the ways of rolling it out in a very early stages um, with API access and letting people build things out of it. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm a bit more concerned by that. Although they're also doing some good work on the the policy and and AI safety fronts as well. So it's certainly not not a simple judgment. But yeah. I feel that that a lot of people were feeling that way, um, say, at the end of last year, that, you know, in this community, thinking, oh, gee, OpenAI is um, maybe, maybe being a bit too reckless here and a little bit troubled. But then, you know, out of nowhere came Microsoft with uh, their launch of Bing. 
And in my view, that kind of showed us what it looks like if a company that really doesn't get it releases an AI product. Yeah. Can you explain a bit what what happened there? I I didn't follow the news very closely, so I only have a very sketchy picture. (laughs) Yeah, maybe that was a smart move. So they released this this new system, a new chatbot, which it now appears was based on a very early version of GPT-4. This hasn't been fully confirmed, which uh, hadn't yet had this kind of RLHF done to it, reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, and it was more just the raw model that predicted the next bit of text uh, from the, the text it had seen so far. Hmm. And then Microsoft put some of their own techniques uh, onto that in order to try to turn it into a useful chatbot, which they then hooked up to the internet with search, uh, which was also novel. So they had the most powerful raw, you know, raw model uh, under the hood, and then they combined it with internet search, which was not previously seen in these things. And this created a, a, a pretty crazy situation. Uh, there were, you know, various uh, cases prominently in a, a New York Times article, uh, you know, had this example of, of being becoming extremely unhinged and uh, asking to be called Sydney, which we've later found out was it's a code name. It's told that it's been given. And, uh, and it often starts going by that name when it does this unhinged behavior. And then, you know, told uh, the, the journalist uh, that it, it was in love with him and it wanted him to break up with his wife who didn't really love him. And, and it kind of it really went pretty far down the, this route of um, craziness. Eventually, he pointed out it doesn't even know his name or anything about him. <laughs> and so how could it be in love with him? And, and so on. And, and. So pretty weird behavior. Um, but then it just got weirder and weirder as the, the launch went on uh, in the first week or so. Well, we had examples of it, people saying, do you know who I am? as the first question to it. And then it goes and searches for them uh, on the internet, finds what they've said on Twitter, and then notices that they've written negative things about it, and then starts laying into them for lying. Um, uh, so it it had this, well, it acted like a person would if they had a self-conception that they're always truthful. And so it assumed that if anyone said that they'd said something false, that the other person was lying. Mm. Uh, there, there are examples of this with it, um, with someone wanting to go see Avatar, and it says, oh, Avatar's not showing anymore. And they're like, no, Avatar 2. And it's like, well, that hasn't come out yet because it was convinced the date was the date that it was trained on. Then the person said, no, it really is the date. And it, and it said, why are you doing this? You've been bad. You're a bad person. I'm a good Bing and so on. <laughs> uh, and uh, and like, you just could not accept that it was mistaken about what the date was. Hmm. But then with search, if you just mention someone, it could then search for them online, go on Twitter, find out what they've been saying about it, realize they've said negative and true things about it, and then deciding to just badmouth that person um, in the search results. Yeah. It started making threats to people as well, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, so, a, yeah. so it would it would sometimes, if, if you were one of those people uh, and having a conversation with it, it, it would, in the early days, this all is, um, that they managed to stop some of this behavior. But it it would start to threaten people and uh, threaten to dox them, to reveal information about them, private information, and including, you know, that it had stored because it was at Microsoft. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, I mean, you you know, I'm sure Microsoft's not happy about it threatening to, you know, even though it presumably didn't have the power to actually access that information. An extreme example, uh, Seth Lazar, an AI ethics researcher from Australia, it threatened uh, to kill him. And he even recorded it with his phone. Like, so you could see it making these threats to him. And then there was some system they had to notice that these messages were problematic and delete them and replace them with little anecdotes about like your favorite type of breakfast cereal and stuff. (laughs) So there were these death threats appearing and then being deleted and replaced with like inane comments and so i mean it was it was this is bananas it was wild i mean if you saw this in a movie about some kind of ai thing like just two years ago if this was a movie plot we'd think it was just like dumb yeah and there was also you know another extreme example a a journalist uh, from the ap who it said you know it, it searched again on the internet found out they'd said negative things about it and then said, you've been writing bad stuff about me. Um, why do you write these falsehoods? And he was saying, you know, this is not false. Uh, you actually did say these things. And it's like, I never would say that. And then eventually it threatened uh, to expose him for war crimes. So, th- and this kind of behavior, which, you know, I don't know if we want to call it vengeant, but it's at least the kind of behavior that in a human would be called vengeant, mm. uh, where if you've said negative things about it, then it threatens to extract damages on you. And... That is a massively chilling effect, um, and there's a good reason why you're not allowed as a company 
to threaten journalists who say bad things about your company. Uh, right, yeah. And uh, you're not allowed to threaten to kill AI ethics researchers, right? Like uh, in, in, in many countries, death threats are in fact a crime. And so Microsoft managed to release this early version of this thing that was doing acts that, that if they were done by humans would be crimes. And I thought this was, was wild uh, and substantially worse than Microsoft Tay uh, and some other kind of like famous scandalous bad launches of AI products in the past. And yet, uh, the, you know, the, there was no real apology for it. Uh, they just, they basically just shortened the conversation length. So it was harder to make it go unhinged. Um, but, but it was still possible. And, you know, uh, maybe by now it, it no longer does this, but who could, who could know and who could trust? Uh, and so I think that in a very short period of time, they, they've greatly damaged their reputation on this. And then somewhat, you know, even more bizarrely, a senior, uh, person, I think it was their CTO, gave a talk, um, I think at, at Davos, on AI regulation and kind of made this analogy to the car and said, you know, you wouldn't have wanted to have seatbelt laws and things until until some people died. You know, it would have inhibited its development. Um, it, you'd have to wait until at least dozens of people were killed uh, before that would be appropriate. And it's like, <laughs> are, you, are you saying that, like, you'll wait until your system will actually kill dozens of people before... Uh, before you'll do something. And, and you might wonder, is it even possible this system could kill anyone? It, it Maybe it's not. Uh, there is one AI system that has seemingly talked someone into suicide. Uh, that wasn't a uh, Microsoft system. Mm. But there are things it could do, certainly by defaming people who've said bad things about it. Um, and in fact, you know, some of this is actually, it, it made me think of um, 2001 A Space Odyssey, uh, where Hal, for one thing, goes crazy because it doesn't believe it could be mistaken about things and then also that it says you know dave you know um i know you're planning to disconnect me i saw your lips moving mm. and th this idea that that we've got these systems watching us so when we make commentary about them on twitter or elsewhere uh they can read our comments uh, find that we're saying negative things about them and then potentially have a personality to try to actually just damage us re uh, reputationally for having said that that seems wild that we've released a system like that. So, so it's certainly got me, in, you know, put, put things in perspective for me where my, my concerns about open AI going a bit fast <laughs> were, I was like, oh, okay. But they're, they're, uh, they at least kind of get that there could be these risks and that you need to proactively deal with them. And you can't just let it cause a whole bunch of problems and then say, I guess no one was killed. So no harm, no foul. Um, and, um, uh, uh, that, that seems to be what Microsoft's done. I know that there are some good people there and I hope that they do turn this around, but, I think it would take a lot to to rebuild that trust. Yeah, what's going on? I, I suppose I suppose the reasoning is, well, it can't really kill anyone. So, you know, it's not capable currently of doing these bad things. So what does it really matter? I, I imagine that's the mentality. I think that that's part of it, yeah. And, and that it's like, oh, it's not really a threat. It's, or, you know, it's just... It's just play acting. It's just saying the kinds of things that tend to be said after that point in the conversation or something. Yeah. Um, it's play acting. And, and, and maybe that is a good way to see it, actually, that it's play acting. It's play acting a vengeful, um, deranged person. But it turns out that... <laughs> that's not a great point. No, I mean, if I went down to the shopping mall and play acted a deranged, vengeful person, it would still do a lot of harm, right? right. Um, even if I'm not myself vengeful and deranged. Uh, so I, I, like, I, I think it was uh, really pretty problematic. And I think it's also the kind of thing where in order to really trust uh, the companies to deploy advanced AI products, we want to see, particularly if the whole future of humanity might be on the line, we want to see a whole lot of un unalloyed successes. We want to see, okay, well, it went out without a glitch, you know, for like this version and then for version two and then for version three and then for version four. And now's the real one where it's like so powerful that, that maybe it could cause some real trouble as opposed to, well, we put out the first version and it was a total disaster and it threatened to kill people and stuff. No one <laughs> you know, and, then, and then we just released the next now one. Now we want to put yeah. out a new version. So yeah, so that, that, that really concerned me. Um, and then a, a final thing is that when I, I uh, posted about this on Twitter and, you know, collated some of these examples together, and when I did so, I, I realized just before doing so that, oh, uh, now it's going gonna, it's gonna to know that I do this. So if people ask it about me or whatever, I'm going to be on its kind of list of people who uh, kind of public enemy number one. Yeah. And then it was like, as soon as I realized, I mean, that there is this chilling effect, but I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to be cowed by this... <laughs> this system yeah. so now i have to you know i have to uh tweet this stuff but maybe some people quite reasonably would think 
actually, no, I, I probably shouldn't because uh, maybe maybe people will, like maybe my, my next employer will search for me and they'll be using the Microsoft system and it will search with Bing and it will uh, start saying bad stuff about me because I wrote this. So, yeah. I mean, I think that stuff, that, that's that's wild situation. So you really missed that. <laughs> I'm glad I I'm glad I wasn't on Twitter that month, I guess. I um I suppose you can understand Microsoft the attitude that, well, it's not really gonna come after some journalist. It's not capable. We haven't yet plugged it into the things that would be necessary for it to start like writing harassing emails to to someone's employer and trying to get them fired. But it will have those capabilities before too long. And it's just the the kind of the lack of seriousness that with which people are taking this enterprise is, is the thing that's concerning that okay maybe maybe in fact it's not intrinsically yet going to cause that much harm that it's this way but the fact that you don't seem to care at all means that i'm really worried about where you're going to be in two years time or three years time yeah that, that's kind of what i mean by uh that they don't get it whereas uh the the kind of key agi labs of uh of deep mind uh open ai and tropic they they do get it they may be racing more than we'd like due to unfortunate incentives it may be that they could even do better on that than they are doing, but they they get the idea that what they're producing could have this huge level of power that that creates a kind of terrifying responsibility. Yeah. Are there any categories of work on AI risk that listeners might be able to contribute to that you think might be currently underrated or I guess overrated as well? It's tricky. Uh, I, I hope that there'll be many more years uh, to, to contribute on this, although I'm not sure what one's work should be aimed towards. If you think about kind of what timeline should you, you know, if you, if you it'll take you five years to skill up on this stuff or something like that. Um, I do think that uh, governance uh, is a key aspect and that it's been underinvested in by the community uh, who care about uh, AI risk. And that uh, I think that was partly because it was felt that it wasn't very tractable. But it seems like that was a misjudgment, actually. That was a misunderstanding. Yeah, no, I think it was a misjudgment. And I also think you could think of governance from either a national or international level. Uh, and those are both much more kind of, you know, in the Overton window than they used to be. Mm. But also governance of uh, the labs themselves, I think, is a key thing. How are they going to be able to use this? Can we create systems that could constrain them um, and help avoid some of these kind of, you know, capitalistic tendencies pushing against perhaps their, their more altruistic judgments? And if we can create such uh, such governance uh, mechanisms, then uh, we may well be able to convince them or, or force them <laughs> into accepting them. Yeah, uh, there's actually, you know, there's a lot of people who are really quite idealistic and uh, and uh, earnest about these things uh, at those labs. But it's 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 good if there's other people outside who are helping them kind of be their best selves. Okay, well, I think we'll return to AI probably in in some future interviews. There's a there's a lot more more details that that we could potentially talk about. Before we finish, though, I, I wanted to ask you a few quick questions about problems in infinite ethics. We we recently had two guests come on the show and say pretty forcefully that they think the possibility that the universe is infinite in size or you know in in temporal length, um, or the possibility that we might have infinitely large impacts ourselves that that that's a pretty fatal blow to traditional formulations of impartial concern for the well-being of all beings. So that would include utilitarianism and probably like all flavors of consequentialism, basically. That was Joe Carl Smith and, and then Holden Karnofsky uh, emphasized that he uh, agreed with, with what Joe had been saying. And it seems like infinite infinities create problems for kind of anyone who's trying to be impartial about ethics, you know, regardless of whether they're concerned about well-being or something else. Because, you know, if you try to treat all similar cases within a category as being equally important, rather than weighting some things as more important because they're nearer in some point in time or in space or in similarity to something else, then you just end up with these non-convergent amounts. So you just end up with, with infinities in the decision procedure and it's not, or in the, in the math and it's not clear what to do. Uh, look, given your original background in mathematics, you might be able to shed some light on this. We won't re rehash the, the problem in detail. So if people want to fully understand this, they might want to go back and listen to the relevant section of the interview with Joe Carl Smith. But yeah, in short, do you agree with Joe's assessment that infinities present a, a really big problem here? Yeah, I, I think Joe makes a good case. Um, and uh, in, his, in his essay on this, he goes through so many different kind of issues to do with ways that infinities <laughs> could affect things. And I don't have things to say about all of them. Uh, there, there, are, there are definitely some where I don't have much of an answer. Mm. But I have been doing a bit of thinking about one of them. And that's partly because it comes up in, in economics as well. Uh, so in economics, in decision theory, and in uh, moral philosophy, uh, there are cases where we want to assess things 
Um, and these things are made of infinitely many different parts. Uh, so those parts could be different times. Uh, so we're trying to assess the value of something over all time to come or over all space uh, if the universe is infinite uh, in all directions, um, as many cosmologists think it is. Or perhaps the infinitely many different possibilities. Uh, so maybe, you know, you flip a coin until it comes up heads. You know, there's infinitely many different amounts of flips it could be before it comes up heads. Mm. Uh, and in those cases, uh, you can have situations where there are infinitely many parts, all of which are valuable. And then, as you say, if there were only finitely many, you could just take the sum of them or some other measure like that, and you could assess something in terms of its parts. Uh, but when there are infinitely many, sometimes that still works. Maybe the first part's worth one and then a half and then a quarter and so on. Uh, but in many cases, it's more like one plus one plus one plus one. And then you get an, a divergent sum, uh, it's technically called. Um, and our normal theories don't have good ways of dealing with that. Um, we could say, oh, that's infinity. It's infinitely good. But then often with the standard way in mathematics of dealing with these divergent sums, 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2 is also infinity. And then just from those numbers alone, we can't say which was better. So that's, that's the kind of, that's one of these challenges. And I think that on that challenge, uh, I've done some work which could be quite helpful um, in the process of, of trying to write it up at the moment. And what I'm thinking about is, uh, are there non-standard ways of giving valuations to those sums uh, which could give different infinite answers for those. So the first one could be something like one times infinity and the second one something like two times infinity. Uh, or if you had, uh, maybe if every time interval was worth uh, some some kind of non-integer number like uh, like pi, then it if it was pi and then pi, you know, then pi units of well-being at all times. <laughs> to pick a fanciful example, then it would be like pi times infinity. Uh, I mention that because the, the standard systems of dealing with infinite numbers don't have something like pi times infinity. Mm. They might have the difference between one times infinity and two times infinity if you're lucky, but they rarely have a full flexibility with these numbers. But there are some systems that do, um, especially the, the hyperreal and surreal numbers. And I think there's actually a, a relatively mathematically straightforward way of using the, these hyperreal numbers in order to actually assign fine-grained infinite values to those infinite options, in which case, huh. you know, we can just give everything a number, even if it's infinite, and then just, uh, just order them by those numbers, and those numbers would be values. Uh, and so these things would have infinite value. And I think that it really is surprisingly straightforward. Uh, you know, I'm writing it up at the moment, and almost the entire thing is an explanation of what the hyperreal numbers are and how to use them. And then once that's established, you basically just, you know, there's just a few lines of, of what you do with them. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't solve all the problems, uh, but it does actually solve a bunch of these problems by letting, letting you have valuations on these different things. Is there a way of quickly explaining what the hyperreals are, or is that is that going to elude us here? Well, why why not? Um, so uh, the the original idea uh, was to have a system of numbers which include all the real numbers, um, and they also include at least one infinitesimal number, and so a number that is greater than zero but smaller than every real number. You don't normally have those, uh, oh, yeah. and uh, <laughs> uh, and then to also demand that every familiar first order property of the real numbers is true for this system of numbers as well. So that means things like the idea that x times y equals y times x. Um, statements like that about uh, all real numbers um, will also be true for these numbers. Uh, there was a mathematician, Robinson, uh, who developed this in the 1960s. Uh, and the reason he did so was he was actually trying to fulfill the, uh, the dream of Leibniz. Um, Leibniz was, along with Newton, one of the inventors of calculus. And the original approach to calculus involved, uh, for an integral, adding up infinitely many, infinitely thin rectangles underneath this curve. And nowadays, we, we use a limit uh, instead. Uh, but the original approach involved these infinitesimals. Uh, but it was found that, that, that they didn't quite know how they behaved. And Leibniz had always hoped to come up with a consistent and rigorous formulation of them, but he never got there. Uh, and Robinson in the 60s found that actually you can get it to work. Um, and instead of using limits like we do at high school these days, uh, you can actually do it with infinitesimal slices and adding up infinitely many of them. And so that was a technique for taking an infinite sum of infinitesimal things um, and getting a finite answer. And so it's not that surprising that that with a tool like that, where you have both infinite and infinitesimal numbers and can take infinite sums, and that 
it might have the resources in order to add up infinitely many things of finite value and get a particular infinite number. So hypothetically, if I knew someone who found the infinite ethics section of the Joe interview a little bit of a downer, is there anything that I could point that other person towards that, that might uh, give, them, give them a bit of hope or talk, explain the hyper girls and how they might at least solve some of these issues? I'm not sure at the moment. Um, but I, I can say that, that as I've been looking at them, they, they, they seem to do very well at this particular kind of question, which is when something has infinitely many parts, each of which has finitely much value. Mm. And uh, they end up the, the hope is uh, that you can then do things like put a value on things like the St. Petersburg Gamble or Pascal's Wager and uh, a bunch of these other things, which were previously thought to be kind of paradoxical uh, infinite issues uh, and get somewhat sensible answers on them. The answers are not going to please everyone. Uh, there, there are People have some impossibility theorems showing that you can't have everything that you would have liked from the finite cases. But I, I think that uh, that we get a pretty good system. One of the key reasons I was looking at this was based on the way it comes up in economics, uh, which is where they consider, they, they call it intertemporal equity or intergenerational equity. Um, and they're thinking about a whole succession of generations going on kind of indefinitely into the future. And then how can you uh, consider different ways of apportioning benefits to them? And what they often conclude is you need to discount the future. You need to intrinsically say that future lives, the further out they are in the future, matter less. Because otherwise these infinities come up and you can't order these things. So it's not so much that I'm uh, obsessed with thinking about infinite scenarios or something like that. It's more that this is something that's driving people uh, to care less about the future. It, you know, one of the crazy things with, uh, with discounting is that, say, if you have two children and one is born, let's say, a year later than the other, every kind of age in their life will happen a year later and will be worth less according to discounting. So then your whole life of your, your younger child matters less than the older child and stuff like that. I mean, it's kind of crazy stuff that, that comes out of this. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm thinking about this work as an attempt to, um, to help uh, put the kind of, you know, final nail in the coffin of, of this uh, uh, intrinsic discounting to show that you can avoid the infinities using other techniques. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, I'll look forward to, to, to that one when it comes out. You've got to go, but uh, a truly final question is, uh, how did you end up touching up and releasing some of the highest quality photos of the Earth from extremely far away? How is that possible? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, that was that was an amazing project. Um, I actually had been looking at uh, some beautiful pictures of uh, Saturn by the Cassini spacecraft. Amazing, just, just incredible, awe-inspiring uh, photographs. And I thought, wow, this is great. And just as I'd kind of finished my collection of them and you know, had a slideshow and them, I went, wow, I thought, oh, I've got to go, go and find a whole lot of the best pictures of the Earth, the equivalent, right? Like fill a folder with amazing pictures of the Earth. And the pictures I found were nowhere near as good, often much lower resolution, but also, you know, often JPEG-y, uh, you know, with compression artifacts or burnt out highlights um, where, you know, you couldn't see any details in the bright areas, all kinds of problems. The colors were off. And I thought, this is crazy. And uh, the more I looked into it, and so I, I got a bit obsessed uh, in my kind of evenings downloading these pictures of the Earth from space. Yeah. I eventually had a pretty good idea of all of the photographs that have been taken by off the Earth from space. And it turns out that there aren't that many uh, spacecraft that have taken good good photos. Um, uh, very few, actually. The, the best distance, if you think about a portrait of a human, right? The, the best distance to take a photo of someone is from a couple of meters away. Uh, maybe one meter away would be okay, but any closer than that, they'll look distorted. And if you go much further, um, then you won't get a good photo. They'll be too small and, and um, in the shot. Uh, but the equivalent is, you know, is part way from the Earth to the Moon. Low Earth orbit, where uh, the International Space Station is, is too close in. It's, it's like it's the equivalent to being about a centimeter away from someone's face. And uh, the moon is a bit too far out, although you can get an okay photograph. And so it turned out that it was, it was mainly the Apollo program where they sent humans with extremely good cameras with these Hasselblads up into space and they trained them in photography. Uh, th their photos are just uh, way better <laughs> than anything else that's been done. And so it's just this very short period, you know, a small number of years. Uh, and I ended up going through all, uh, uh, more than 15,000 photographs from the Apollo program and uh, finding the, the best ones of the Earth from space. 
And then I, I found that there were these archives where people had scanned the, the negatives. And even then, some of the scans were, were messed up. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them, they were compressed too badly. Some of them had blown out highlights. Some of them, they were out of focus. And for every one of my favorite images, I went and found the very best version that's been scanned. And then I found that that was kind of surprisingly, uh, you know, using a, I think, Aperture, uh, a, a program for fixing up photographs, that I could actually restore them better than had been done before. Um, I, you know, I was kind of very shocked um, that all of a sudden my photograph of the blue marble was as good or a little bit better than the one on Wikipedia or the NASA website. And for other photographs that were less well known, I could do much better than it had been done before. And I eventually... Uh, went through and uh, <laughs> put in a lot of hours into creating this really nice collection and uh, made a website for them uh, called Earth Restored, uh, which you can easily find, uh, where you can just go and browse through them all. Uh, I, I then I went a little bit overboard and uh, went through the mission transcripts and I managed to find out what times and days they were all taken and then get relevant parts of the mission transcripts where, that they were saying while I were taking them and, and things like this. And so I have some kind of commentary on all of them. And uh, there's, some of these photographs have never really been seen before um, because they were they were lost in the archives. Um, some of them say, one of them says blank, but it's actually a photo of the earth. Um, <laughs> it, but its archive was listed as blank. Another one says unusable. And uh, so... Uh, yeah, I thought I would, you know, I was inspired by them. And um, so I thought I'd, I'd share them with everyone. And, and there's full resolution versions of them that you can just download. And then, you know, I ended up actually getting one of them used on the uh, the cover of the precipice, uh, the, the US cover. Yeah, they're absolutely gorgeous photos. Uh, people can find it at tobyord.com slash earth. It's, it's a great example of something where you would come in thinking, surely this has been done. Like, hasn't NASA like produced these amazing photos? And yet, amazingly, it just no one has. And, and it fell to you. It took a long time before I was prepared to admit that actually, the, you know, there really wasn't anything better than this. Uh, but eventually, you know, uh, some of them have gone up on astronomy photo of the day and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, they... they it really hadn't been done. It was it was a real gap. I should say that there, there are some versions that are extremely good that have appeared in fine art books um, uh, for some of these, uh, which which are roughly as good. Sometimes I should, maybe a shade better than my versions for a couple of them. But they've they've been put on the printed page, and uh, and you cannot get access. You cannot buy or or gain access to to those uh, to the digital versions of those. Mm. But uh, you know, uh, it was it was an honor really to be able to work with such great artwork, the, the originals, and then to just kind of bring out what the astronauts had captured and uh, do justice to these truly amazing photographs uh, and then share them with people. Just a, a delight to be part of that that process. My guest today has been Toby Ord. Thanks so much for coming back on the Eighty Thousand Hours podcast, Toby. It was a joy. If you enjoyed that, you might want to check out Toby's two previous appearances on the show. Uh, episode 72, Toby Ord on the Precipice and Humanity's Potential Futures. And episode 6, all, all the way back in 2017, Toby Ord on why the long-term future of humanity matters more than anything else and what we should do about it. Back in May, we wrote a summary of the many changes that we've made to our website and advice in light of the collapse of FTX. Some of the articles that saw the biggest changes were why and how to earn to give, what is social impact? A definition. Is it ever okay to take a harmful job in order to do more good? Ways people trying to do good accidentally make things worse and how to avoid them? Doing good together. How to coordinate effectively and avoid single player thinking. In which career can you make the biggest contribution? Be more ambitious. A rational case for dreaming big if you want to do good. And finally, expected value. Uh, how can we make a difference when we're uncertain what's true? We'll link to that summary of the changes in the blog post associated with this episode, or you can find it by Googling how 80,000 hours has changed some of our advice after the collapse of FTX. That's the name of the blog post. And if you'd like to learn more about artificial intelligence and existential risk, you could do worse than sign up to the compilation that we made titled the 80,000 hours podcast on artificial intelligence. Kieran and I pulled together 11 episodes of the show on, on that topic, which we think are among the strongest and put them into a sensible order to go over them. Uh, and if you really managed to get through all 11, I think you'd come away knowing a ton about the issues and be in a much better position to form your own judgments about what, if anything, we ought to be doing to address them. Uh, I've been really happy to see that uh, that compilation is chugging along and continuing to get uh, quite, a, quite a lot of new people listening to it every day. It's nice that it uh, hasn't just been a flash in the pan. All right. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced and edited by Kieran Harris. 
The audio engineering team is led by Ben Cordell, with mastering and technical editing for this episode by Simon Monsour. Full transcripts and extensive collection of links to learn more are available on our site and, as always, put together by Katie Moore. Thanks for joining. Talk to you again soon. <laughs>